Good evening, and uh, let's come to order, please, and go on the record. My name is Edward Finley, and with me this evening are Commissioners Danola D. Brown Bland, Jerry C. Nockham, James G. Patterson, Lyons Gray, Daniel G. Klotfelter, and Charlotte Mitchell. The Commission now calls for hearing docket number E100-157, in the matter of the 2018 integrated resource plan reports and related 2018 renewable <coughs> energy portfolio standards compliance plans. <coughs> integrated resource planning or IRP is intended to identify those electric resource options that can be obtained at least cost to the ratepayers consistent with adequate reliable electric service. IRP considers conservation efficiency and load management as well as supply side alternatives and the selection of resource options. North Carolina General Statute Section 62-110.1c requires the Commission to develop, publicize, and keep current an analysis of the long-range needs for electricity in this state. Uh, to meet these uh, requirements of uh, the statute, the Commission conducts an annual investigation into electric utilities IRPs. In even-numbered years, each of the electric utilities must file a biennial report that contains the specific information set out in the Commission rule. In addition, Commission Rule R867B requires an electric power supplier subject to Rule R60, R860 to file a Renewable Energy Portfolio Standard, or REPS, compliance plan as part of its IRP report. Commission rules also require the electric utilities to include their, in their IRPs information on how planned smart grid development would impact utilities resource needs. Utilities are required to file smart grid technology plans every two years with updates in the intervening years. On May 1, 2018, Virginia Electric and Power Company doing business as Dominion Energy North Carolina filed its 2018 integrated resource plan and 2018 REPS compliance plan. On September 5, 2018, Duke Energy Progress and Duke Energy Carolinas filed annual RF or uh, IRPs and 2018 REPS compliance plans. On September 27, 2018, the Commission issued an order scheduling a public hearing to be held on this date, at this time, and in this place for the purpose of taking non-expert public witness testimony with respect to the file, IRP reports, and REPS compliance plans. The Commission's order also required Duke Energy Progress, Duke Energy Carolinas, and Dominion to publish notice of this hearing in the newspapers having general coverage in their respective North Carolina service areas. The companies have uh, filed affidavits in this docket stating that the required notices have been published. On October 1, 2018, all three companies filed their 2018 Smart Grid Com Technology Plans, SGTPs. The public staff's participation as a party in these proceedings is recognized pursuant to GS 6215D. And the following parties have been granted intervenor status in these proceedings by commission order. The North Carolina Sustainable Energy Association, the Carolina Industrial Group for Fair Utility Rates, uh, Environmental Defense Fund, Carolina Utilities Customer Association, the North Carolina Waste Awareness and Reduction Network, North Carolina Clean Energy Business Alliance, Southern Alliance for Clean Energy, the Natural Resources Defense Council, and the Sierra Club. Ecoplexus and Broad River Energy. The Office of the Attorney General filed a notice of intervention in this document pursuant to statute on uh, uh, December 21, 2018. On November 8, 2018, N.C. Warren filed a motion for evidentiary hearing, uh, and on uh, November 15, 2018, uh, Duke Energy Carolinas and Duke Energy Progress filed a response in opposition to that motion. Uh, Dimension also filed a motion in office, uh, uh, a response in opposition to that motion. On December 14, 2018, NC Warren filed initial comments regarding the IRPs <coughs> of Duke and, uh, and, and Progress. On December 17, 2018, the Environmental Defense Fund filed comments on the SGTPs. On December 17, 2018, the Commission issued an order requiring interim CPRE program reports allowing interim implementation of the CPRE program plans and establishing schedule for filing of comments in this docket and the docket numbers E2 sub 1159 and E7 sub 1156. The order established November 5, 2018 as the date on which DEC and uh, Deke Energy Carolinas and Deke Energy Progress 
or to file interim reports regarding the status and results of the tranche one CPRE RFP solicitation. The order also set uh, January 31, 2019 as the date for all parties and public staff to file initial comments on the CPRE program plans filed on September 1, 2018 in this document. Reply comments addressing uh, other parties' initial comments were due March 29, 2019. On uh, January 16, 2019, comments on the SGTPs were filed by the public staff NCSEA and NC Warren. Numerous statements of position regarding the electric utilities IOPs have been filed in this docket by co customers, consumers. Pursuant to the State Ethics Act, I remind all members of the commission their duty to avoid conflicts of interest and inquire whether any member of the uh, commission has a known conflict of interest regarding the matters coming to us this evening. There be, there be, there be no conflicts, and the record so reflect, and we will proceed and then I'll call on the council for the parties to announce their appearances for the record, beginning with the utilities. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Members of the Commission, Robert Taylor appearing on behalf of Duke Energy Progress and Duke Energy Carolines. <coughs> Mr. Chairman, members of the Commission, Brett Bryceford, law firm Aguara Woods on behalf of Dominion Energy North Carolina. And with me this evening is uh, my associate, Chris Mattis. Uh, ben Smith, I'm here on behalf of the North Carolina Sustainable Energy Association. Good evening, Kristen Wills here on behalf of NC Warren. Teresa Townsend with the Attorney General's Office. Heather Fennell, the public staff on behalf of the Using the Consuming Public. We also have with us Diana Downey and Bob Gillen. Officer, do you read your statement, please, sir? Ladies and gentlemen, I remind you that this is a court proceeding held in, a court, in this courtroom. Therefore, order and decorum are required. Testimony will be taken from witnesses. Others in the courtroom must re remain silent and not interfere with these proceedings. The chairman will instruct you as to the rules and regulations to be followed. Please pay attention to his instructions and adhere to them. Thank you, sir. Uh, we welcome everybody here. We've got a big crowd. Some of them are not even in the room tonight uh, so far. Before we get started, there are a few preliminary matters that need to be covered as to how the proceeding will go forward. Before we do so, uh, there are, are there any matters that any party needs to bring before the commission's attention before we get started? Preliminaries. Uh, the sole purpose of tonight's proceeding is to hear non-expert public witness testimony regarding the 2018 IRP reports and the 2018 REPS compliance plans filed in this document. We appreciate your coming out tonight to voice your views on this important matter. We welcome your testimony and are glad that you are here. There are a few ground rules that we're going to have to follow. Uh, there are a lot of people who are here tonight who have signed up, so we want to get uh, through that and let everyone be heard to the extent that they are able to do so and to take into account what you have to tell us. Conducting this hearing, the commission functions as a court. We are in a courtroom uh, for that purpose, and we do this pursuant to state statutes. We take sworn testimony. Again, pursuant to statutes that have been established by the General Assembly, we take testimony pursuant to the rules of procedure and evidence prescribed by the legislature. We must apply the rules so that the hearing proceedings go forth in an orderly manner. I request that you voluntarily agree and abide by the rules and trust that you will do so. If not, the Commission has remedies available to it, such as striking testimony, removing those who are on uncooperative, civil contempt, and other more severe remedies required by statute. We don't intend to follow those because we don't think we will need to based on the uh, conduct, conduct of the parties here. The Commission wants to ensure that everyone who desires to speak on the issues relevant to the document have an opportunity to do so and make the point that they believe the Commission should consider. In order to facilitate a full and fair opportunity for all speakers to participate, the Commission has guidelines for public hearings, and these guidelines briefly are as follows. Witnesses must register to... Uh, on the witness sheet that has been submitted to the public staff, if you haven't signed up, you need to do so, uh, and verify that they are non-party witnesses in the case. In order to allow each person an equal amount of time, there will be a limit of uh, two minutes on the amount of time for each witness to speak. Therefore, witnesses should endeavor to avoid cumulative, repetitive, and irrelevant testimony. We hear a lot of things over and over again, and so if somebody's already said what you need to say, you're welcome to come up and say, I repeat what they would have, what they said, and I would have said it myself uh, if I 
if I had it because of the state from the start. Witnesses shall be sworn in. I must have witnesses swear or affirm prior to the witnesses providing testimony. Each witness must be sworn in and must affirm in order or must affirm in order to have that testimony received into evidence. In lieu of oral testimony, witnesses may submit written testimony as long as they swear to its accuracy, written statements must be submitted by the person under oath during the hearing, at which time the witness will be subject to cross-examination by any party desiring to cross-examine the witness. Uh, persons who are not customers of the utility will be called, uh, persons who are uh, customers of the utilities will be called first. Other persons called to testify will be called in order in which they are registered on the witness sheet. <coughs> However, we may decide to call a witness or witnesses in a different order if we determine that such a change would provide a fuller spectrum of opinions and ideas. Only one witness may testify at a time. Witnesses shall refrain from offering opinions on matters not specified in the notice of hearing for this document. Also, witnesses should address their testimony to the commission, these seven people up here, Focus on the issues presented by the IRP and refrain from making personal criticisms of the parties and other hearing participants. The testimony is being recorded by the court reporter. Therefore, to ensure, in, uh, to ensure accuracy of the record, I may limit unconventional modes of testimony. No singing, please. To ensure that all witnesses are heard and their testimony is properly transcribed by the court reporter, the commission will maintain hearing room decorum. We have a right to instruct security to, re to remove any member of the audience who is attempting to participate out of order or in any verbal or visual manner that is inappropriate. In addition, members of the audience shall refrain from bringing signs or other placards into the hearing room. We understand that there's some little yellow pieces of paper. You're welcome to show those if you like. Uh, we don't allow questions of the parties of the commission. You're here to tell us what you want us to hear. Uh, if you have questions, and some people obviously do, then the parties uh, are here to answer those questions at a break or after the hearing is over. But the parties' attorneys will have an opportunity to cross-examine all witnesses, uh, as will the commissioners. Usually in a case like this, the cross-examination is very limited because we want to move through the docket and let you be heard uh, expeditiously. The Commission's goal is to receive information that will help the Commission make a decision in this matter. The Commission wants everyone to feel welcome and comfortable in voicing their relevant views. Therefore, please do not disturb the hearing by clapping, booing, hissing, or other such behavior. In addition, uh, please refrain from personal criticisms or attacks on the participants, including the applicants' attorneys and the representatives uh, of the Commission and the public staff. Bear in mind that there are a lot of people who are here that want to be heard, so please get to your point quickly and be succinct as possible and avoid repetition in order that all may have a chance to be heard. So uh, let us begin by, her, by having the public staff call witnesses. I think she's going to talk to you about the order in which she's going to call you. I'm going to call um, everyone up in a uh, list of four. Everyone will get to speak individually, but I'll just call up in a group of four so you have an idea of who's coming up next. So first we'll have Colson Combs, then Lily Levin, then Laura Combs, and then Kay Reibold. So first is Colson Combs. There is an overflow room across the hall that is, the, the, the sound is piped in over there, so if you get tired of standing in the back there, you can go over there and uh, sit down in that overflow room. If, sir, if you'll put your left hand on the Bible and raise your right hand, please. Sir. If someone is about to testify about to get this case, we can the whole room, not the one the truth, God. I do. Could you please state your name, address, and your electric provider? Uh, Colson Combs, uh, 135 Cattle Farm Drive, Raleigh, uh, NC 27603. And uh, my electric provider is Duke Energy Progress, I believe. Okay. Thank you, commissioners, for the chance to speak today. My name is Colson. I'm 15 years old. Some of you may know me. I have presented twice before the commission, both times advocating against Duke Energy's annual proposed integrated resource plan. Now I'm here for a third time. I would not be here if I didn't have to be. The government that represents me doesn't seem to care about my future or the futures of all the other kids who will be affected by climate change. I am here again to fight for those futures and to strongly urge you to demand, to demand that Duke Energy drastically improve its plans for renewable energies and its IRP. We are living in a dangerous and scary time. The threat of climate change is real and it is here now. We are living in a time in which oceans are rising, temperatures are in flux, and natural disasters are wreaking more destruction than ever before. Just consider the myriad storms that have struck the East Coast in the past several years, and the terrible wildfires that have been ravaging California. 
Rising temperatures have changed weather conditions to allow these hurricanes to spiral out of control. And these conditions have dried out the California landscape to the point that it takes very little to burn. We would have to be blindfolded not to notice that our world is changing for the worse. On top of these intensifying natural disasters, our oceans are rising and putting on countable numbers of people in danger. A United Nations report, Nations report states that 2 billion people could become climate change refugees by 2100. 2100 may seem distant, but the fact is that your children and grandchildren may live to see that time. Is this the world that you would be proud to pass on to them? If we all do nothing, that world will become a reality. I realize that you do, you do not on your own have the power to magically solve the problem of climate change. But you do have the power to hold Duke Energy accountable. In its 2018 IRP, Duke plans to have 8% renewable energy by 2033. In 2015, the governor of California signed legislation to promise that all of California would utilize 50% renewable energy by 2030. When other states and countries can do these kinds of things, why can't we? Duke Energy can do better, and so can North Carolina. I know it, you know it, and Duke knows it. So for all our sakes, please demand that Duke Energy drastically increase its plans for renewable energy in its IRP. Thank you. Thank you. Lily Levin. I do. Please state your name, address, and the electric provider. Uh, Lily Levin. My address is 3101 Doe Hill Court, Raleigh, um, 27612, and my electric provider is Duke Progress Energy. Uh, dear commissioners, thank you so much for the opportunity to be here. I thought I was going to be the youngest one, and I'm so glad that I'm not. Um, I'm, <laughs> I'm 17 years old. I'm a senior in high school. Um, I'm a part of a youth activist organization called Triangle People Power. Um, we're based on the ACLU's grassroots agenda, and I also wanted to make some points um, to raise about this IRP report and how it is so urgent and so incredibly important that we ensure that Duke Energy has a greater renewable energy plan. Um, so for example, um, right now at least, Mid-American um, Energy has 48% renewable energy, San Diego Gas and Electric has 43% renewable energy, but Duke has a 3% um, renewable energy for 2018. Um, and then, as the gentleman before me stated, um, Duke ha has a plan for 8% renewable energy by 2033 when other states are um, going towards 75% um, and 100% renewable energy plans. However, I could restate the statistics. What's most important here is the stories, right? So, people here have been incredibly affected by these frontline issues. Um, there are people here um, where the Atlantic Coast Pipeline is going right through their backyards, where they're seeing their properties and their family and their lives being demolished by Duke Energy's plan for natural gas and cancerous chemicals coating the pipeline, right? Um, there are people here who have been so severely affected by fossil fuels, especially low-income communities of color, which is why this is not just an environmental issue, right? This is a social justice issue. And we, I just wanted to end with the fact that we are running out of time. Duke Energy doesn't seem to understand this, but we are running out of time. Um, so it is our job as citizens, as youth, as people who will inherit this future for the further generations to state the fact that we we are here and we're not going to let up. And Duke Energy is running out of time, too. Um, they need a more a higher renewable energy contingency plan. Thank you so much. Laura Combs. I do. Could you please state your name, address, and electric provider? My name is Laura Combs. I'm at 135 Cattle Farm Drive, Raleigh, North Carolina, 27603, and my provider is Duke Energy Progress. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, commissioners, for the opportunity to speak tonight. Um, it's intimidating to come after these two young people, and I'm so grateful to see them here. Um, you know the facts about climate change. You know the facts about Duke Energy's Integrated Resource Plan. And two minutes isn't even enough time to go through all the problems with that. Um, what I guess I want to make today is more of an emotional appeal. Uh, Colson is my son. He's been coming here for three years. It is great to see kids turning out now for this issue because it is their issue. My background is, an environmental plan as, a, is as an environmental planner. And I've worked on ecosystem management and sustainability issues since 1989. 
And I've been saying for years that I have failed my son. My generation has failed him and his friends. His grandparents' generation has failed them as well. And you give me hope, this, the makeup of this commission, because we've seen through time that Duke Energy has a strong influence in North Carolina's government and citizens are left without a voice. And I'm grateful for you all being here and listening to these kids and these other people. Um, what I want to leave you with is, I worked on Smart Meter Opt-Out issue. Uh, I volunteered my time on that. And you guys made a great decision on Smart Meter Opt-Out recently and I'm very grateful for it. And I want to remind you of Duke Energy's role and in reach into the government agencies such that citizens don't have the voice that we ideally would like to have. And I'm going to give you a 2015 letter that I wrote to the Department of Health and Human Services and you do have that, it was submitted to you. And uh, what happened at that time in 2015 is that DHHS went from working to represent the people to more working to represent Duke Energy. And part of their emails that I got through public records request states, okay guys, Duke Energy can do better than this. How can I continue to advocate for your individual handling of opt-out solutions without, with results like this, end of quote. And that was from uh, Lee Cox of, D of uh, DHHS. And basically DHHS began advocating for Duke Energy to write, uh, and they wrote a report that was not reflective of the best available scientific information to convince you to not allow opt-outs for smart meters. And that's a small issue. We have much bigger issues, as you've heard from these kids. The reach of Duke Energy is so strong and so far, and we need you in your role to stand up for the citizens, and I greatly appreciate your time. Thank you. Yes. Um, do I leave you? Kay Rival. I do. Could you please state your name, address, and who your electric provider is? My name is Kay Rebold, and my address is 4108 Yates Mill Pond Road in Raleigh, 27606. And my my electric provider is um, Duke Energy Progress. And I appreciate the honor of being here and being able to testify. Thank you so much, commissioners. I wanted to point out uh, uh, this home energy report that I received recently, and many of many of you do receive this. It asks, "How am I doing?" And then, "How can I save more?" And it suggests every little bit helps. And unplugged chargers when not in use, and also weatherize your home. I'm I'm here to to say that one way that I think we could really help consumers would be to to pay attention to Duke Energy and Dominion energies greed and it really does come down to greed and we're asking i'm asking the commissioners to reject duke and dominion's irp report real concern i have is many years ago i testified before the commission on behalf of low income and elderly in wake county and in north carolina and it saddens me deeply that here we are again witnessing and experiencing tremendous suffering from marginalized communities and people, beings without a voice, because many, all of creation will suffer if Duke Energy and Dominion Energy continue with their, I have to say frankly, their greed, and also on this thirst for pipelines that are simply not necessary. So finally, I wanna urge the commissioners to really consider the sacred privilege of your position that this really is a life and death struggle. Um, it's a tremendous power, I think, and privilege that all of you have to make a difference in really monitoring Duke and Dominion and considering how to go forward in the future, especially on behalf of those who suffer the most. Thanks very much. The next group of four are Martha Duralami, Amanda Robertson, Nasif Majid, and Kathy Buckley. We'll start with Martha Girolami. Sorry. 
I'm as well. That's what I'm about to give in this case will be the truth. The whole truth and nothing but the truth shall be gone. Thank you. Could you please state your name, address, and who your elected provider is? I'm Martha Girolami, 473 Mount Pisgah Church Road, Apex, North Carolina, 27523, and it's Duke Energy Progress. Thank you for the chance to talk. The Duke Energy Integrated Resource Plan fails to meet the present and future um, electric resource needs of North Carolina in the most, quote, reliable and economic way possible, end quote. It fails in this basic mission for the people of North Carolina. Both reliable and economic, economic energy policy must be based on the laws of science. Science tells us that our natural world and hence our lives are greatly altered by the increasing atmospheric greenhouse gas concentration and rising temperature. Duke Energy's IRP ignores the damage from these changes to our climate by increasing the investment in natural gas infrastructure, by burning natural gas and by not planning and supporting rapid change to renewable energies for most, if not all, our energy needs. Carbon dioxide equivalent atmospheric concentration is now nearly 411 parts per million, well above the level of less than 300 parts per million for the last 300,000 years. The laws of nature dictate that heat trapping in our atmosphere caused by greenhouse gases, mostly carbon dioxide and methane, are now resulting in present climate instability, dangerous levels of ocean acidity, weather extremes, and global warming. This IRP is not smart. It's sort of DE's Duke Energy's bottom line. It is harmful to the citizens of North Carolina. Does the North Carolina Utilities Commission intend to serve Duke Energy or the common good. This IRP does not meaningfully address climate change. That must be done. Our new world must respond to climate change. The UN IPCC says humans must cut annual global greenhouse gas emissions in half by 2030. That is 11 years from now. We are running out of time. Duke Energy in this IRP plans to build more natural gas pipelines, compressor stations, and power plants. Duke Energy's commitment to renewable energy is trivial. At 8%, this way is way behind many other utilities who have reached 30, 40, 50% renewables and plan to do better. The Duke Energy IRP is self-serving and unjust. It fails to respond proportionately and rapidly to the looming and present climate disaster. It plans to increase its methane and carbon dioxide emissions, which contribute to the climatic and economic damage to North Carolina. We can't fix with money the scale of damages in North Carolina to food production, forestry, coastal tourism, fisheries, houses, jobs, health, clean water, clean air, soil health, and poverty. This IRP is not just a risky gamble with our future. It dooms our state to economic and climate destruction. The science says for the future of life on Earth, this IRP is insane. Thank you. Amanda Robertson. Sorry, thank you. You saw Ms. Wendell Tessie Wendell about to come to this case. We'll make the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I do. <coughs> thank you. Please state your name, address, and your electric provider. Sure, Amanda Robertson, 244 Prince Creek in Pittsburgh, North Carolina. I have two electric providers. One is Amanda Robertson. We have an 18 kilowatt system with battery backup on our house. And our secondary provider is Duke Energy Progress. Thank you. Thank you. To me, this is the single most important public hearing ever held by our North Carolina Utilities Commission. The decisions you will make regarding the IRPs of Duke and Dominion are of monumental importance for all of us, for the entire planet. You will help decide in an enormous and impactful way if we will reach that global rise in temperature from which there is no return. I wish I had that power. I have fought so hard in my own community and across the state to advance clean renewable energy, to sway the governor and DEQ to reject the Atlantic Coast Pipeline, to protect the last unsegmented forests in our state, to protect those elements essential to all life, clean air and clean water. But this is real and it's terrifying for all of us. But I don't have the power to make this decision. You do, each one of you, you have that power. Duke Energy is by most measures the largest energy company in the United States, one of the largest in the world. 
That's why this is so important, why this decision is so impactful. And our state's governors have granted each of you decision-making authority to approve or reject the IRPs on behalf of the welfare of North Carolina citizens and utility cu customers. For myself, a Duke customer, and on behalf of North Carolina Climate Solutions Coalition, of which I am co-chair, I urge you tonight to reject their IRP in its entirety, their plan of only 8% renewable energy and a buildup of frack natural gas from now through 2033 dooms this entire planet. No justification, no justification is worth that. Please take this decision very seriously. It is truly the single most important decision each of you will ever make in your entire lifetimes. And you will have to live with it. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Roberts. Yes. Thank you for coming. Oh, thank you. Uh, Nasib Majid. Uh, Chairman Finley, I will affirm, sir. All right, you may affirm. You saw me from the testimony you're about to give this case about the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. <coughs> yes, sir. Could you please, please state your name, address, and your electric provider, please? My name is Nasif Majid. I reside at 5401 Rupert Lane, Charlotte, North Carolina, 28215. My provider is Duke Energy. Uh, good evening again, and my name is Nasif Majid. I'm a member of the North Carolina General Assembly House of Representatives. I'm honored to represent the citizens of Charlotte Mecklenburg, uh, many who are deeply concerned and seriously troubled with uh, Duke Energy's planned use of highly uh, dangerous frack gas and the Atlantic Coast Pipeline as one of their primary sources of electric power generation for our state. This includes the faith community, business leaders, civil rights organizations, communities of color, local and state elected officials, and highly respected environmental and community organizations who recently came together and passed a historic unanimous resolution and strategic energy action plan in Charlotte that calls for 100% clean renewable energy by 2030 in the public transportation and building sectors. I'm here tonight to respectfully request that the NC Utilities Commission delay making a decision on Duke's IRP until there have been a series of public hearings throughout this state and discussions on the Atlantic Coast Pipeline and the use of frack gas with experts in the field of climate science, uh, clean energy engineers who have expertise on the safety and the cost of methane pipelines like ACP and substantial hearings with communities of color, especially Native Americans and African American communities whose health safety, historical tribal lands, and well-being can be seriously impacted. The Commission should also closely examine the many benefits of a rapidly transition to clean renewable energy such as wind and solar, which includes more job creation uh, than the ACP, not using dirty, dangerous methane gas or coal. Renewable energy versus frack gas is cost-effective. The world renowned climate scientist Dr. Robert Horrath has repeatedly warned that the use of frack gas and subsequent release of methane is one of the most dangerous greenhouse gases that will create a climate catastrophe. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Representative Machine. Congratulations on your election. Well, condolences. <laughs> <laughs> Kathy Buckley. I do, sir. And if you could please state your name, address, and who your electric provider is. Kathy Ann Buckley, 710 Independence Place, Raleigh, Duke. Thank you. Please make your statement. Thank you. I am a climate reality leader and a mother. I am opposed to Duke and Dominion's IRPs. At a recent Duke University conference, a former Attorney General staffer stated our dilemma well. Duke Energy is really a construction company. Whatever they build, they are guaranteed a very handsome profit. If they produced energy as responsibly, effectively, and efficiently as they possibly could, they would build less and not make as much money, as their job is to enrich their shareholders 
If you let them, they will build, build, build. And their plan for us ratepayers, pay, pay, pay. Of course, your mandate is to do what's right for the businesses and residents, all the ratepayers of North Carolina. In this case, what is best for ratepayers' wallets also happens to be what's best for future generations. And amazingly, that is also best for Duke Energy. History shows that an entrenched industry is the last one to see the writing on the wall. This commission could compel Duke Energy to respond in time to the revolutionary changes we are witnessing now in energy production. I urge you to hold an evidentiary hearing which would be so critical to help you make this decision. Speaking of revolutions, when the American colonists declared independence from Great Britain, they were doing something unheard of. No subjects had ever told their king, thanks so much, but we'll be heading in a new direction now. And so we fired the shot heard around the world. You regulate the most powerful utility in the United States, the King George of utilities. The United States is the most powerful nation on planet Earth. You hold incredible power. Very few, including most heads of state, are in a better position to turn us toward a promising energy future. I pray that you, from the depth of your hearts, for the love of all our children, say with wisdom and courage, thanks so much, we'll be heading in a new direction now. May you issue the finding heard around the world. Thank you. The next four are Joel Siegel, Aram Friedman, Matt Legerton and Kendall Hale. We'll start with Joel Siegel. I so just wanted to testify about the this case with the truth, the whole truth, and that's what the truth I've got. Yes, I do. If you could please state your name, address, and your electric provider, please. Joel Siegel, 4568 Randolph Road, apartment 127. Duke Energy is my provider. You may please make your statement. Hi, good evening. Um, let's say that an energy company went in front of you with a proposal to drop an atom bomb for the largest cities in North Carolina and told you that there would be no radiation, no fallout, no cancer, no death. As a result, you'd probably reject um, that proposal. Similarly, the Atlantic Coast Pipeline um, is probably one of the most dangerous proposals that we've seen in the United States in decades because as um, Asif Majid said, the, the fallout, methane gas fallout, can tip us to that 1.5 centigrade where that destroys basically the world. So you are in a great position to have the legal statutory authority uh, to make sure that doesn't happen. What I predict is that Duke Energy will collaborate with all of us in this room and move this state rapidly to 100% clean renewable energy. Why? It'll be cost effective, it'll decrease the uh, actually the bills of the ratepayers, and it won't destroy the planet. And I believe that each and every one of you on this commission is going to make the right choice. I'm also honored to say that I used to work for this gentleman named Dan Claude Felton after I graduated from UNC Law School, who prepared me well for when I went to the United States Congress. For, I worked for John Conyers for 13 years on energy. I want to tell you that in Congress, we would have already had 10 to 15 hearings, at least, minimum, on the ACP and frac gas. Please do a series of hearings, evidentiary hearings, on climate change, impacted communities, um, what frac gas can do to our atmosphere, because you cannot make a decision of this magnitude that's going to impact not only North Carolina, but the jet stream, and whether or not we survive as a planet and one or two hearings. Do several, and we'd love to help you. we got the scientists to help you. Thank you so very much. Aram Friedman. <clears throat> so I'm just going to have the testimony about to hear from this case, Mr. Kimmer. Is the truth the whole truth and nothing about the truth, Dr. God? I do. Please state your name, address, and your electric provider, please. It's Avram Friedman, 1346 Dillsboro Road, Silver, North Carolina, 28779. I'm a Duke Energy customer. Uh, good evening, Commissioner. 
I, I looked through the uh, IRP of Duke Energy Carolinas. Uh, I wasn't able to take the time to read it all thoroughly, honestly. But I saw enough to understand that this IRP is a business plan designed to maximize profits for a private corporation. It's not a plan to serve the best interests of the public. It's certainly not a plan to address the urgent climate crisis we're now confronting. The United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change issued its latest report last year, as you know, and you know. The worldwide scientific community using the most sophisticated technology available, accessing the most comprehensive data collected from satellite images, oceanographic studies, ice core examination, and other empirical hard evidence, has concluded that climate change is caused by human activity and is happening at a much more catastrophic rate than what was considered possible even a decade ago. They said last year that humanity has about 12 years to eliminate most of its carbon producing activities or the damage will be irreversible to avoiding, uh, for avoiding the worst consequences. This integrated resource plan seems oblivious to that reality. We need a plan to fight a war against greenhouse gases for the survival of humanity. I don't see that plan here. Where is Duke Energy in that war? Where is the Utilities Commission in that war? Where is the plan? The nation of Germany has a plan to rapidly phase out all fossil fuel infrastructure. That's a plan. The Sunrise Movement and about 40 members of Congress who support the Green New Deal have a plan to save humanity by transforming to 100% renewable energy within 10 years. That's a plan. But, well, and the Canary Coalition has a plan, uh, the Efficient and Affordable Energy Rates Bill that will change the economics of energy production and usage in North Carolina by compelling uh, residential, commercial, and industrial rate payers to invest heavily in energy efficiency and rooftop solar energy. That's a plan, and, and you've seen this before, I'm going to give you copies of it once again. <clears throat> But all I'm seeing here is business as usual denial of an impending global catastrophe with no plan to address it. Just continuing on the path of making profits by burning more fossil fuels. Where is your plan? Show us a plan, please. Thank you. Thank you. We'll mark that as Freeman Exhibit 1. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Freeman. Matt Legerton. <coughs> Good evening. Good evening. Could you put your left hand on the Bible, please? I want to affirm, please. Okay, you don't have to put your left hand on the Bible. You saw me affirm the testimony about to give this case to be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Yes, sir. If you could please state your name, address, and your alleged provider. Um, I'm Reverend Mac Ledgerton. I'm a minister, educator, and advocate from Pembroke, North Carolina. My address is Post Office Box 9 in Pembroke, and my provider is Duke Energy. Please make your statement. Because of the seriousness of these three utility plans, I make the following recommendations. One, to hold at least two additional public hearings on these IRPs in Charlotte and Asheville, similar to your previous rate hike hearings. Two, hold an evidentiary hearing uh, in, and so that experts can testify, similar to that you held involving the rate hike requests. Third, to reject the proposed IRPs as both inadequate and incomplete for the following reasons. One, the need for the plans for massive increases in energy use and supplies in Virginia have already been rejected in Virginia. The greatest discrepancy and cost factor in the Duke IRPs is this, and I'd like for you to write this down. When combined, when you combine the two, Duke's two IRPs plans uh, call for increasing natural gas use by an average of 13%. Y'all, please write that down or keep it in your mind. 
while increasing natural gas resources by an unprecedented, unprecedented 65%. And the Atlantic Coast Pipeline, the source of this massive expansion of natural gas resources is not even mentioned in these plans. Second, there is no plan B. The Atlantic Coast Pipeline is in trouble and may never be built and this plan needs a plan B in case that happens. Third, Transco, you maybe have not seen this letter, has told FERC that they can provide all the natural gas that's needed for both Carolinas. That's a fact. And I will submit that by the 15th and you can get it directly from FERC. Before approving any plans, we all need to know the projected costs of this massive 66% increase in natural gas resources while only using 13% of it by 2033. Why invest in such resources that won't be used and may never be used to serve ratepayers in North Carolina, all at our ratepayers' expense? The solution is simple. Reject these plans, ask for a cost projections for developing the resources to meet only the 13% increase in natural gas use, then compare these projections with a cost analysis from Transco and compare them. We need healthy competition and cost comparisons. We need and deserve that from you. We can argue over whether we need a bridge fuel or not, but we certainly don't need a new pipeline and its massive costs and cost overruns of $1 billion a year to provide it. Transco can provide it at much less cost, and your mission is to find the cheapest price for all of our ratepayers. The ACP is now the most expensive natural gas pipeline in the United States and probably in our history, with costs rising by $1 billion a year. Duke wants to hold the bag while we hold the burden. We need to go back to the drawing board and ask Duke to only give us a plan for what they will use until 2033 and not ask you or we as rate papers to bear the risk of the burden of unused resources, most likely that will become exported fuel at the expense of North Carolina rate payers through the LNG plant being built in Elba Island, Georgia. In reality, what this plan means to my community of Pembroke, we're being forced to host four pipelines, including the one that will eventually go to South Carolina that was most likely in the original plan of the ACP. An existing compressor station, a metering and regulation station, all in one place. Please uh, wrap it up if you can, Mr. Lampton. Got other people want to testify. I'm sorry? Please wrap it up if you can, please. Okay. Also an LNG facility, I'm in the last sentence, and possibly a carbon fiber plant in the very middle of the Lumpy and Tuscarora tribal territories. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Kendall Hale. I'm just going to testify about the evidence case with the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth shall be done. I do. Can you please state your name, address, and your electric provider, please? Uh, my name is Kendall Hale, and my address is 372 Sharon Road in Fairview, North Carolina. And Duke Energy is my energy provider. And because I'm not allowed to sing, I will read the poem. It may ring a bell from the distant past. I'm not repeating anything anyone said before. The climate here is a changing. Come gather round, commissioners, from under your stones, and admit that the waters around you have grown, and accept that soon you'll be drenched to the bone. If your time to you is worth saving, then you'd better start swimming for your lives may be blown, cause the climate here is a changing. Come Duke and Dominion who live by the wind, keep your eyes wide, your chance won't come again. And don't speak too soon, for the wheel still spins, 
And there's no telling who it's naming. For us losers now are planning to win because the climate here is a changing. Come deniers and liars throughout the land and don't criticize what you don't understand. Scientists and youth are beyond your command. Your empire is rapidly burning. Please get out of the way if you can't lend a hand because the climate here is changing. Come regulators, commissioners, please heed the call. Don't stand in the doorways and don't build a wall. For those who fall down will be those who stalled. And there's a storm out there and it's a raging. It will soon shake your windows and it will rattle your halls because the climate here is a changing. The line it's drawn and the curse has been cast. Us slow ones now will later be fast as the present now will soon be past. Fossil fuels are rapidly fading. And you in command will soon be last because the times here are a changing. Thank you, Bob Dylan, one of America's greatest poets. Thank you, sir. Okay, the next four are Mark Markopoulos, Louis Zeller, Tom Clark, and Karen Bearden. And we'll start with Mark McCarpolis. I'd like to affirm, please. Okay. I'll be affirmed with testimony about the case with the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I do. Can you please state your name, address, and your provider, please? Mark Markopoulos, 7207 Southern Trail. Chapel Hill 27516 and we have our own generating system and we get a little power from Duke as well. Turns out if you have your own generating system you slip to the back of the line here. It's interesting. I'm a county commissioner in Orange County and a couple weeks ago I sent out a letter uh, urging local government officials to call for a new direction at NC Energy Policy and about 40 officials signed it and you can read the letter and see who signed it. Local mayors, county commissioners, city council, uh, a, lot of, a lot of people very concerned. There are no economic or technical barriers to the kind of transition required by the climate crisis. The only barrier is political will. We call on you to assert that will beginning with the rejection of Duke Energy's archaic energy generation plan. We call on you to reject Duke Energy's IRP as proposed and demand that it be revised to reflect actual trends in the energy industry which are racing toward clean, cheap, reliable renewals and storage and away from the fossil fuels that are badly disrupting our climate. It is our duty and yours as public servants to do everything in our power to reduce greenhouse gas emissions immediately and to keep electricity affordable. Other states are already demanding more from the utilities. Virginia recently rejected Dominion Resources IRP. The California Utilities Commission rejected proposals for new natural gas burning power plants in favor of cheaper solar plus storage options. And you've heard it from other people. Methane is the biggest accelerant of climate change right now. And you're potentially on the verge of allowing Duke Energy to burn more methane, to create more methane gas in the atmosphere. And it's unconscionable. And I hope that you know, I, I presume that you do know, that a majority of North Carolinians want clean energy. Especially after the recent hurricanes. The awareness has grown. People are, they see what needs to be done. And this old school IRP is not what the future requires of us for our children. So please represent the people instead of the Duke Energy shareholders. You have a very big and important decision to make. And I hope you choose wisely. Thank you. Zeller? Thanks. Mr. Webb, tell me please raise your right hand, please. You saw Ms. Webb, the testimony about the, this case, the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, sir. I do. Could you please state your name, address, and your electric provider, please? 
My name is Lewis Zeller. I'm executive director of the Blue Ridge Environmental Defense League. My home is in 226 Hamilton Lane in Glendale Springs, North Carolina. Our provider is uh, Blue Ridge EMC, and they're uh, also Duke Energy. Please make your statement. Thank you. On behalf of Blue Ridge Environmental Defense League and our members in Virginia and North Carolina, I hereby request that the North Carolina Utilities Commission reject the integrated resource plan submitted by Dominion Energy North Carolina. Further, we uh, and establish a process by which a cleaner, smarter plan can be developed and implemented. Further, we support the similar requests made by other parties in this proceeding directed towards Duke Energy. We see in reviewing Dominion's IRP that a common element in all five options includes eight combustion turbine plants totaling approximately 3,664 megawatts by 2033. The whammy in this is that natural gas pipeline connection will add further costs. A former Attorney General for Virginia was openly scornful of Dominion's intent to dump cost of construction for the natural gas Atlanta goes pipeline on ratepayers. He said that non-Dominion experts testified that the pipeline would raise power bills by $2.5 billion over the next 20 years. Perhaps the former Attorney General's counsel struck a nerve because on December 7, the Virginia State Corporation Commission rejected Virginia Power's integrated resource plan. Two factors, costs and greenhouse gas emissions were cited. The rejection was unprecedented. The ball is now in North Carolina's court. Investment manager Sanford Bernstein, a private investment manager, uh, citing the costs of $4 billion and $7 billion for the pipelines under construction, said that this, according to them, this translates to $1.3 to $2.6 per million BTUs, almost certainly more expensive than any other power supply. Dominion's IRP is out of step with this reality. Generating electricity with natural gas is a dead-end technology. Natural gas fuel once deemed to have advantages over fossil fuels, over, such as coal, is the wrong thing in the wrong place at the wrong time. Thank you for the opportunity to present these remarks. Tom Clark. I would like to affirm. I do. Thank the commissioners for your time tonight. Let's Duke, get your name on the record. Tom Clark, 4643 Goldsboro Road, Wade, North Carolina. Duke Energy Progress is my Sorry. Duke Energy is in its IRP is stating that they will reduce carbon emissions. I only have one problem with that statement. How can you reduce the amount of carbon emissions when you have planned to build a 36 inch pipeline with 1.5 billion cubic feet of fracked gas going through it each day through our state? Natural gas is a methane and a lot of it is leaked or intentionally vented at many points from well to power plants. Since methane is 100 times more potent than CO2, I don't understand Duke's statement about reducing carbon. To me, that seems to be a false statement. I don't know about the panel, but when I was in school and you gave a false answer on a test, you failed that test. I would just like to add that there are no economic or technical barriers to the kind of transition required by the climate crisis. The only barrier is political. Duke Energy executives are out of touch with the climate science they're out of touch with their corporate responsibilities, and most of all, they're out of touch with their ratepayers. And for that reason, tonight, I ask this commission to reject Duke Energy's RP. And thank you for your time. Karen Bearden. Please state your name, address, and your <laughs> provider. Please. Thank you. Um, Karen Bearden, 1809 Lake Park Drive, Raleigh, 
27612 and Duke Energy. Howdy, so my name is Karen Bearden and I am the 350 Triangle Coordinator. North Carolina is affected by the climate crisis now. Duke Energy's current IRP plan to only have 8% renewables by 2033 is so unacceptable. It is critical to move to a just transition to 100% renewable energy fast, y'all, with the urgency of the crisis that we are in. Solar combined with storage is already getting cheaper than the toxic energy from coal, fracked gas, and offshore drilling. Gratefully, 18 municipalities in North Carolina have passed 100% renewable energy resolutions already, so work has just begun. But Duke Energy's monopoly is making it harder for those of us to move forward. To be a real climate leader, North Carolina must stop all new fossil fuel projects. No Atlantic Coast Pipeline, Mountain Valley Pipeline, compressor stations, and more. As 16-year-old Greta Thunberg recently shared at COP24, until you start focusing on what needs to be done rather than what is politically possible, there is no hope. We cannot solve a crisis without treating it as a crisis. We need to keep fossil fuels in the ground, and we need to focus on equity. And if solutions within the system are so impossible to find, then maybe we should change the system itself. Because of the climate crisis we're in, the North Carolina Utility Commission needs to reject this IRP. Thank you. The next four parts. Thank you all for your cooperation so far. We're moving nicely. Uh, and we appreciate your willingness to listen to the instructions. Thank you very much. The next four, Stephen Norris, Denise Bone, Lauren Hentz, and Daniel Parkhurst. So we'll start with Stephen Norris. <coughs> Norris, if you put your left hand Bible and raise your right hand, please. The psalmist will the testimony about to give this case will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Sir. I do, sir. You can state your name, address, and your electric provider, please. Uh, my name is Stephen, Dr. Stephen Norris. I live at 372 Sharon Road in Fairview, North Carolina. Uh, I get at least half of my power from the sun simply because my windows face south, and I get the rest of my the power from Duke Energy. I am here tonight because this IRP, Duke's plans, must be rejected. Must be rejected. We have no choice because we have no time left. The fossil fuel regime that has dominated our economy and our technology and brought enormous benefits to all of us for, uh, on all of our lives the, that uh, empire must come down and a new way of doing things must be built. We have no choice. As you all know, and the IPC re IPCC report made clear, and as the U.S. government re reports themselves have made clear, we have no time left. Ten years, twelve years, 15 years is, in terms of the history that we're talking about, no time. This is an emergency. It is a crisis. It is as, as serious as any crisis my, um, I have experienced in my lifetime, and I was born during World War II. So I have seen many crises, including some that uh, you, you, people in this audience are too young to have experienced. We must deal with it. Now, the Utilities Commission is in, legally, a great place to do that. Uh, it, the law, the General Statute 62-2 that established the Utilities Commission says that the regulation, of the, your job is to regulate public utilities in the interest of the public. Your job is to regulate the utilities in the interest of the public. I'm sure you know that. But the interest of the public right now is to survive. The interest of the public is to stop superstorms like Florence, like Michael, like 
uh, Katrina and like Harvey and, and like Maria. We have seen these thousand year floods happening every year. Three of them in North Carolina. It must stop and you have the responsibility and the opportunity to do that. Please be heroes. Please stand up. Please be Thomas Jefferson and make this happen. Thank you. Denise, I would like to affirm. I'll be from the testimony about the conspiracy with the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Yes. Please state your name, address, and your provider, please. My name is Ashley Denise Bruce. My provider is South River Co-op. My address is 1616 Beard Road, Wayne, North Carolina. I am going to be giving a comment on behalf of Sustainable Sand Hills. We are an environmental nonprofit located in the Sand Rails region, serving eight counties, including Duke Progress customers. Sustainable Sand Hills recommend that North Carolina Utilities Commission reject the proposed integrated resource plan. Duke Ener as Duke Energy has failed to ensure the plan is harmonious with the environment and the people of the Sand Hills region. The Sand Hills region of North Carolina has experienced two 100-year flooding events in the three-year period following Hurricanes Matthew and Florence. Experts have implicated climate change as a contributor to the extreme weather events experienced by communities in the Sand Hills region. Multiple scientific organizations, including the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, have concluded that climate change is in fact caused by anthropogenic activity, primarily the burning of fossil fuels. Furthermore, the extraction and use of fossil fuels has been linked to the pollution of our natural resources and the degradation of our public health. Yet, Duke Energy's RIP depends on the burning of fossil fuels, including coal and frack gas, for the next 14 year, 15 years. For the welfare of our communities, Duke Energy must act now to reduce North Carolina's dependence on finite energy resources, protect our land, water, and air, and safeguard our public health from ag adverse effects of fossil fuel-based power generation. While Sustainable Sand Hills recognizes Duke Energy plans to reduce its carbon footprint, we urge Duke to evaluate its reliance on fossil fuel, create a more diverse energy plan, and invest more in the resources in renewable technologies such as wind and solar. So today our communities can reap the benefits of a cleaner energy for tomorrow. Thank you. Lauren Hintz. I'd like to also affirm. Right. Solemnly uh, affirm the testimony about the case. Please the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I do. Can you please state your name, address, and electric provider, please? My name is Lauren Hens, 804 Kings Mill Road, Chapel Hill, North Carolina, 27517, and Duke is the provider. Um, ever since I studied, at Rocky Mountain Biological Laboratory have been well aware of the problems associated with climate change and believe you as the Utility Commission need to take that and other environmental and economic issues in consideration. First, I urge you to require the utility coal power plants that exist to continue the old EPA requirements of minimal heavy metal contamination such as mercury from entering the air. Second, you need to require the utilities to measure the escape of methane gas from current pipelines fueling utility power plants and of course monitor and stop the leakage of natural gas from residential and commercial distribution systems. This is a, a conservation component of the plan. Finally, I concur with many others that you need to require North Carolina to obtain a much greater percentage of energy from renewables such as wind, solar, and hydroelectric. Currently, many nations in Europe already have a very high um, production of electricity from renewables. Even the nation of Costa Rica um, now gets 98% of their electricity from non-fossil fuels. Many other states in the north and the west of here have higher renewable energy requirements. We need to require the same for Duke and other utilities. What value is appropriate and attainable for North Carolina? Given what has already been obtained around the U.S. and world, I believe you should set a minimum of 40% um, by the year uh, 2030. And 
hope you do it. And I got 30 more seconds. So uh, my, my son asked me to say that, um, who's now 23, is this whole issue about uh, helping the next generation is really, really vital. So please do it. Thank you. Daniel Parkhurst. I do. Please state your name, address, and your last name. Daniel Parkhurst, 10121 Falls Metal Court, Raleigh 27617, and Duke Energy Progress. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Daniel Parkhurst. I'm the policy manager at Clean Air Carolina, a statewide nonprofit whose mission is to protect and improve the overall air quality of this state. And today, I wish to express our concern for the IRPs presented, especially Duke Energy. We believe that the plans in place, especially concerning renewables, are out of step with the stated will of the people of North Carolina. Everyone here today is well aware of the myriad of reports of effects of climate change. The IPCC report, the fourth annual climate assessment. You know about the public health threats of climate change, the dangers of increased temperatures, heavy precipitation, extreme weather events, natural disasters, and you know the economic effects that climate change will have, especially here in North Carolina, where Duke Energy repairing extensive damage to our power infrastructure is likely to be felt directly by the ratepayers. In order to truly protect the ratepayer and serve their interests, Climate change must be a consideration, and yet climate change only appears in the Duke Energy IRPs once, and it is within a quote from the Department of Energy rather than directly. Electricity generation represents 36% of all greenhouse gas emissions in North Carolina. Uh, and the will of North Carolinians to reduce these and expand renewables, especially solar, has been clear. 11 cities and 7 counties have renewable energy resolutions on the books. 37 cities have greenhouse gas reduction plans. Executive Order 80 further calls for redu reductions statewide, and it should be seen as a challenge for Duke Energy. The General Assembly even has made a similar plea through HB 589. It should be seen as a guidepost. The current Duke Energy IRP may lead to short-term decreases in greenhouse gas emissions, but it falls far short of the urgency of the problem that we face. The requirements to meet climate change directly require bold solutions, and North Carolinians have made their voices heard. HB 589, city and county resolutions, EO 80, each of these provide a guidepost for the future that the IRP currently cannot meet. The people and our elected representatives are calling for a future of renewables that does not include a grid mix with a background on GHG emissions, which is why we also call for an evidentiary hearing and dramatic changes should be made to the Duke Energy IRP that will reflect the will and needs of our state and our world. Thank you very much. The next four are Harvey Richmond, Bob Rodriguez, Dale Erbez. Sorry, thank you. And Irene Kaigan. You saw me swear the testimony about to give this case away the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I do. Could you please and state I, your name, address, and your provider, please? Yeah, my name is Harvey Richmond. I'm a resident of Apex 200 Evergreen Chase Court. And uh, my, I just recently moved to Apex from Cary. My understanding is we're now Apex Utility, but it gets its energy from Duke Energy. Um, my comments, I belong to several environmental groups. Uh, my comments tonight are, are on my own. They're not on behalf of any organization. I'm going to leave uh, written comp, uh, copies, and some of my uh, comments have already been, the points have been made, uh, so I'll give you written comments to provide for the record. Uh, in addition to the mandate to provide reliable and affordable energy, our public utilities need to provide clean energy that is consistent with the sustainable energy future that protects our air, our water, and our climate. The public, as you've heard, is demanding changes from Duke Energy's business as usual plan. Cities and counties across North Carolina, including Wake County here, Orange County, Buncombe County, Charlotte, Asheville, Boone, Hillsborough, and others have already adopted 100% clean energy goals. These local governments have pledged to move to 100% fossil free energy. Transitioning to clean energy will reduce the impact of climate uh, and climate change as well as provide jobs for the future. Unfortunately, Duke Energy doesn't appear to be fully listening to its customers, be they residential, commercial, or governments, who are all increasingly demanding a transition to clean, renewable energy. 
The governor just committed North Carolina under Executive Order 80 to reducing greenhouse gas emissions by 40% uh, by 2025 across all sectors. Duke's IRP calls for 40% by 2030, five years later. While other states throughout the nation are committing to significant increases in renewable energy, this draft IRP estimates will only have 22% of our energy from a combination of demand-side management, solar and, bat solar and battery storage. In order for North Carolina to reach the goals set forth in Executive Order 80, North Carolina will need to move away from fossil fuels such as coal and frac gas. Instead, North Carolina should be investing heavily in energy efficiency and clean energy sources, including solar and on and offshore wind. Despite Duke Energy calling frac gas plants a clean source of energy, as you've heard from others, methane is leaked at each stage from extraction from Pennsylvania to transmission through pipelines to end use and is 80 to 100 times more damaging to our climate. I urge the Utilities Commission to reject the draft IRP and Duke Energy, send Duke Energy back to the drawing boards. It's time for the Commission and our energy companies to catch up with the public and lead a transition to clean energy future that will protect our health, protect our economy, and help slow the impacts of climate change. Thank you for your time. Well, you have a larger copy, just give it to yes. the public staff over here, please. Bob Rodriguez. Commission? Good to see you, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, yes, sir. Can you please state your name, address, and huh? your provider? Okay. My name is uh, Bob Rodriguez. I'm over at 2400 Countrywood Road, Raleigh, 27615. And uh, again, I'm a split provider. I actually have Duke Progress Energy, and I also have a, a 4.5 kilowatt solar array in our home, in our house. Mr. Rodriguez, you always have a lot to tell us, so please pay attention. No, I'm, well, you know, thank you, yes, yes, Commissioner. I will send written statement later, more detailed stuff, so thank you all. I want to say thank you, Commissioner Chairman, Commissioners, everyone on the panel here. Uh, you know, I was just sitting here watching this, you know, that, that clock is kind of endemic of the problem we're facing right now. Um, the time is ticking away here. So rather than give you a lot of statistics in that, I'm going to just highlight a few things which I think are, to me, poignant. You know, I'm a concerned citizen. I'm a part of uh, North Carolina Interfaith Power and Light, which is a, a program of the North Carolina Ch Council of Churches. I'm a businessman, a shareholder, and also a utility customer. What I'm going to say is that I think the overdependence, for, I'm going to ask you all to ask Duke Energy to go back and try again with this uh, IRP. This is not what we need right now. We have to do better. And the reason for this is I'm going to say is that in 2030, according to the, the page 70, 71 or so of the IRP, we're looking at what, 8% renewable, 5% efficiency, uh, energy efficiency, and 40% still fossil fuel dependency. What I would propose is that when, not if, when a massive carbon tax comes into play as things really start to go south, as we're already seeing the climate, I'm not going to say in oscillation, Australia is burning up, we go from minus, I mean, from 19 degrees to 70 degrees in less than a week. Things are really going to go south. I would say that Duke Energy stands to lose somewhere between 20 to 30 percent of their customers, probably in an 18 month time frame. How do I know that? Because I have lived through that as a business person in that same time frame of the transition of technology. The thing they have going for them is the fact that they're a utility and they have some legal way to help slow this down. The bad news is the change is coming and it's coming like a freight train and there's going to be no way to stop the grid defection which the Rocky Mountain Institute has so well written and documented. Solar, storage, other means of solar generation is going to happen and these customers will be gone forever. And lastly, the people who did not do it, those who are fixed income, those people who are working two or three jobs are going to pay the price because when that 20 or 30 percent of people leave, they're going to be asked to pay the additional make up the price. So, so commissioners, that's what I ask you to say. Go back for Duke Energy. They can do better. They must do better. Thank you all. Thank you, Mr. Roderick. It's good to see you again. Same here, sir. Dale Evans. Oh, you hasn't called me that since I was a kid. <laughs> I'd like to affirm. May I affirm you? Yes. Affirm you affirm the testimony you're about to give in this case will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Yes, I do. Can you please state your name, address, and your provider? <laughs> Dale Everts, 2205 Pershing Street in Durham, and Duke Energy is my provider. 
Thank you, um, commissioners, for both uh, hearing our testimony and for listening. Uh, I, until recently, I led the Climate and International Group of the Environmental Protection Agency. Uh, in that role, I served with other scientists and policymakers on a high-level advisory group that in 2011 issued a United Nations report on short-lived climate pollutants. The report dealt in part with methane, natural gas, that Duke Energy is proposing to greatly increase the use of in its IRP. As others have said, methane is significantly more effective, 100 times more effective than carbon dioxide in trapping heat. It also contributes to ozone smog, a pollutant that affects lung development in children as well as people with asthma and lung disease. Ozone damages food crops such as corn, wheat, and soybeans. Methane lasts only about a decade or so in the atmosphere, and this is actually good news compared to a century or more for carbon dioxide. So reducing methane emissions now means less heat trapped now, not decades from now, and less ozone smog to affect our health and agriculture. This is important. Reducing methane means healthier air for us and our children, and less of this very potent heat trapping gas in the air where it fuels the more intense and wetter hurricanes, severe weather, and coastal flooding that is costing our state billions of dollars. Our UN report showed that full implementation of the technologies to reduce methane and other short-lived climate pollutants would reduce future global warming by half a degree centigrade, while avoiding 2.4 million premature deaths and the loss of between 1 and 4 percent of the global production of major food crops each year. Methane is released from oil and gas operations, including fracking, and from the transport of natural gas via pipelines. The best way to control methane is from these sources is to re reduce the demand for natural gas, the opposite of what Duke Energy is proposing. I'd like you all to make North Carolina a leader in this transition to the cleanest, cheapest, most stable, and reliable sources of energy modern society has ever known, sun, wind, water, and energy storage and away from increasingly expensive and dirty fossil fuels. Help save the ratepayers you are here to represent billions of dollars in the coming decades, both in terms of the cost of electricity and the avoided costs of damaging climate change and air pollution. Please send Duke Energy's IRP back to the drawing board. Thank you. And I will submit my remarks. Irene Kagan. I do. Can you please state your name, address, and your electric provider? My name is Irene Seigen. I live at 210 Madison Grove Place in Cary, zip code 27519. My provider is Duke Energy. Thank you for this opportunity to speak. Although I am a member of several environmental organizations, I'm speaking here not as their representative, but as a North Carolina citizen and a Duke Energy customer. And as a citizen and customer, my concerns are the economic costs of our energy, the reliability and the effect on the environment, and I'm also very concerned about climate change. Climate change is real. In Carolina, many more natural disasters have occurred in recent years, and climate change is a big factor. The cost of recovering from these disasters is astronomical, and the cost in personal suffering is even larger. Duke is in a position to make a change that would benefit future generations in cleaner air, lower energy costs, and taking a stand against even more disruptive climate change. They can opt for renewable energy sources and less environmental damage, or they can continue to burn fossil fuels to benefit neither their customers nor the environment. Duke plans to continue running most of its coal-fired power plants. According to its plans, Duke will continue burning coal for the next 30 years, until 2048. And the plans do not even analyze whether Duke could save money for its rate payers by retiring the coal fleet even sooner. Duke should retire these coal-fired plants ahead of schedule and invest in clean solutions like energy efficiency, solar power, and energy storage. Duke's plans assume that renewables, energy efficiency, and demand-side management will be used to meet 7% of total system energy needs this year. And over the next 15 years, that number will only increase to 13%. Duke can and should do better. 
Building new fossil fuel plants and investing money in old ones to keep them running extends our reliance on fossil fuels at the very time when science tells us we need to be transitioning quickly away from these causes of climate disruption. Considering the uneconomic nature of coal and fracked gas and their environmental impact, I urge you to reject Duke's long-term energy plan. You should require the company to conduct an economic analysis of its coal fleet and submit an actual least cost plan that focuses on energy efficiency, demand response, and clean sources like wind and solar. It is the right thing to do for our present and future citizens. Thank you. Thank you all right, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to take a little break now. Let the uh, court reporter uh, uh, let's come back on the record uh, again. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your cooperation. Thank you for your uh, salient and forceful remarks. Uh, we've heard from 24 people, and my understanding from the public staff is that we have 27 more to go. And I'll remind you that if somebody else has said what you want to say, you can say I agree with that person and make the salient points that you want to make in addition to those. Somebody is at the end of this list, and I'm sure that person would appreciate it if uh, folks would be brief. <laughs> right, let's call your next witness. The next four are Heidi Zamel, Mark Bishop, June Blotnick, and Kevin Edwards. We'll start with Heidi. <coughs> I'm sorry, the testimony about the biggest case is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth shall be gone. Yes. Please state your name, address, and your electric provider, please. My name is Heidi Zano, and I'm uh, 103 Notting Oak, Chapel Hill, North Carolina, and it's Duke Progress Energy, I think. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So Duke's, uh, Duke. Energy, Duke Energy's plan for generating just 8% of power from renewable energy sources by 2033 is incredibly irresponsible. Given that North Carolina is already one of the state's hardest hit from climate change, the extreme flooding in eastern North Carolina from storms like Hurricane Floyd and Florence is not normal. NOAA studies show that sunny day flooding from sea level rise is right at the worst in the country in parts of the North Carolina coast in areas that didn't flood years ago, even in high tides. There was uh, home value loss of $582 million in North Carolina from 2005 to 2017, according to First Street Foundation, from flooding. Even without hurricanes, month-long rain bombs have caused major problems in places like Calabash, North Carolina, where large areas are now considered flood plains that never were in the past. Heat and humidity have risen, and the polar vortex has repeatedly been pushed down into North Carolina as the warm air from ice melt in the Arctic destabilizes the jet stream. We're also already suffering from crop loss and unprecedented loss of species with foodstuffs like coffee, cocoa, and hops becoming increasingly difficult to grow around the world. The most frightening part of climate change to me is that as the climate warms, methane bubbles begin to emerge in lakes and waterways and the Arctic permafrost. These can send enough methane into the air, a greenhouse gas 100 times more potent than CO2, to rapidly accelerate the heating of the planet out of control. Natural gas wells also leak methane, which exacerbates climate change. Duke University researchers have found 100-year-old oil and gas wells in Pennsylvania still leaking large amounts of methane in the air and water. The more of these wells that are created, the more there are to leak. And literature from gas companies themselves, like brochures from Schlumberger, talk about major leaks from concrete degradation over time in fracking wells, and they also release methane into the air during normal operations. Clean renewable energy is getting to be as affordable as dirty energy, and it does not come with the cost of increased asthma and cancer rates from air pollution. In 2017, about 17% of national electrical consumption came from renewable sources. That's already much higher than what Duke Energy plans for 2033. Other utilities in the United States are already at 30% renewables or more. Why can't North Carolina create a better, more sustainable present and future instead of making things worse and putting us all into an even more untenable situation? We are dependent on a fragile planet to have a safe place to live and for food and water. Prominent scientists say emissions must peak and start downboard by 2020. And the IPCC said we must cut greenhouse gas emissions in half by 2030.
Mark Fisher. Good evening. Your song is one of the tests we're about to give this case will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so kind. I do. Please state your name, address, and how much of the Yes, my name is Mark Bishoprick, 973 Laurelwood Drive, Eden, North Carolina, 27288. And I both buy from and sell to Duke Energy. I'm, I'm an owner and operator of Irvine River Company. We own and operate the Spray Cotton Mills hydroelectric facility in Eden, North Carolina. The project that we currently operate at this site was built in 1930, operated as a parallel generating plant for many years until Spray Cotton Mills and Duke entered into a 15-year PERPA contract to buy all, sell all in 1994, in keeping with North Carolina's policy to encourage utilization of these existing renewable resources to produce power for the consumption of North Carolina ratepayers. 2006, I formed Irvine River Company and Irvine leased and then purchased these hydroelectric assets of spray cotton mills, which discontinued its cotton yarn spinning business in 2001. Over the last 12 years, Irvine River Company has invested hundreds of thousands of dollars upgrading the infrastructure serving this hydro plant as well as refurbishing the machinery and adding new digital controls so that the system could operate more effectively, believing the recovery of this investment would come over a long period of time. We employ three employees full-time and part-time in the operation of this plant, in addition to using several specialized contractors to maintain and upgrade the infrastructure. Our capacity at this site is approximately 0.5 megawatts, and we've generated 3.5 to 4.0 gigawatt hours of energy per year consistently since 2006. We're a run-of-the-river facility with more water generally available in the winter and spring months coinciding with the current demand, peak demands on the grid. In 2009, we entered a new 15-year contract with Duke Energy, but are very concerned that in the latest IRP calculations filed, the utility reflect, does not reflect it, anticipating to renew these contracts from hydro and other sources as the sources come up for renewal in the coming years. We believe that not renewing these contracts with our existing plan is, is not appropriate, while others privately owned or utility owned facilities are being added to the state's grid, especially since we don't have a right to sell our power other than to monopoly owned state utilities. So we, uh, we have upgraded, refurbished our facility with the intent to continue to run in the future, providing reliable power day and night throughout the year. This power is currently being purchased by Duke and then distributed to local customers. And when our contract comes up for renewal, we intend on exercising our purple right to renew the contract in anticipation that the North Carolina Utilities Commission will support the right through its oversight and implementation of state and federal laws. Here's a copy. Oh, firm. I do. Uh, June Blotnick, 2517 Belvedere Avenue, Charlotte, North Carolina, 28205. Um, I have a four kilowatt system on my roof, um, and Duke Energy is my other provider. I'm June Blotnick, and I'm the Executive Director of Clean Air Carolina. We're a statewide organization working on air quality and climate change issues. And we have about 1,500 members across the state. I'm here to urge the Utilities Commission to reject Duke's IRP. And this is what my comments used to look like. And it's like, OK, when it gets like this, we better just put it down. <laughs> so um, I'm just going to say a couple things. One, I was in this room or another room in this building probably five or six or seven years ago. 
protesting or objecting to Duke's um, projections for energy efficiency programs. And at that time, I remember saying, you know, before you make your decision, you may want to check with your colleagues over at the North Carolina Division of Public Health to um, make the connections between energy generation and public health. Um, I don't believe that this or anybody in this room really considers this IRP a lease cost plan. Um, Duke's coal plants should be forced to compete with other energy sources like solar and battery storage which are cheaper and cleaner and better for public health. Um, I did want to call your attention to this magazine. It wasn't put out by the Division of Public Health but it was put out by the North Carolina Institute for Medicine. It is the North Carolina Medical Journal. It is uh, the October, uh, September, October issue of last year, and it's all about environmental health in North Carolina. Um, there are three peer-reviewed articles in here, original research from Duke University and um, ECU. Um, ECU article is about climate change impact on health of Eastern North Carolinians and the um, article uh, by Duke University is about the health impacts of people living near coal plants. So just want to call your attention to this and um, you know think about 10 years from now is there going to be another journal where we're going to have research showing the health impacts of uh, moving forward with fossil fuels and uh, frack gas. So thank you very much. Kevin Edwards. It's almost like the testimony about to give this case away the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth shall be gone. Yes, sir. Can you please state your name, address, and your electric device? Please? Kevin Edwards, 916 Comer Road. Stoneville, North Carolina, 27048, and I buy from and sell to Duke Energy Carolinas. Uh, my family's three plants are typical of small hydro in North Carolina. They use existing dams over a century old, and two are at former textile mill sites. Currently, we employ five people to run these plants. We also work at other hydro plants in North Carolina and across the U.S. Our plants operate run of river steadily around the clock. Due to seasonal variation in rainfall, our generation is greatest in winter and spring when the state's capacity need is greatest. The Avalon plant has been producing electricity since 1997 and the Mayo plant since 2001. Both of these are in Rockingham County. Our Spencer Mountain plant in Gaston County was built in 1906, was owned by Duke for many decades, and was a very early participant in the state's grid. My wife Amy and I bought the Spencer Mountain plant in 2015 and are investing in improvements which we expect to significantly increase generation. All three plants are in Duke Energy Carolina's territory. Combined, the three plants currently produce about 9.5 gigawatt hours per year, which is enough clean energy to power approximately 900 homes. Small hydro plants were among the first to provide independent renewable electricity to North Carolina starting in the early 1980s. These plants produce clean, clean efficient energy and provide jobs in at least 17 counties in the state. Most of these jobs are rural or in small mill towns. Unfortunately, though, our industry is now at risk of shutting down. In the most recent IRP, Duke determined that it will not renew existing power purchase agreements upon expiration. We believe this is unfair because our existing plants are being zeroed out, even as new utility and privately owned generators are being added to the state's grid. We believe that the state should not replace existing PERPA plants with new capacity. Our plants have run for decades and will continue to run far into the future, providing reliable, renewable, indigenous electricity for North Carolina. We have a PURPA right to a new contract, which we intend to exercise later this year when our Avalon plant's contract expires. Avalon's capacity is about 1.2 megawatts. Under the new rules, hydro facilities larger than 1 megawatt will have to negotiate with utilities in this uncertain environment. We cannot move an existing plant, nor can we sell to anyone except the utility and we are very concerned about the result of a negotiation under such circumstances. Thank you all very much. Yeah, what's, uh, what, uh, what streams are your dams on? We are on the Mayo River, which is a tributary of the uh, 
the Dan and then the Roanoke, and we're also on the South Fork of the Catawba River. Thank you, sir. Thank you for coming. The next four are Pat Moore, Michael Matthews, Jerome Wagner, and Beth Henry. And we'll start with Pat Moore. That's why you're about to give this case with the truth. The whole truth and nothing but the truth. I'm firm. Please state your name, address, and your provider, please. I'm Patricia Moore, 200 Providence Road, Suite 100, Charlotte, North Carolina, 28207, Duke Energy. Good evening. Um, I'm amending my remarks as well. Um, in solidarity with some of the speakers with whom I strongly agree. Um, today, more and more people are aware of global climate change and the havoc that it wreaks. One would think that Duke Energy would join with enlightened families, with enlightened utilities to focus on renewable energy. People in our communities are moving to save money and save the climate with clean, safe, efficient, and renewable local energy. You've heard them tonight. But Duke's monopoly and its business plan will make it hard for North Carolina communities to achieve their climate goals. And so we turn to you, Chairman Finley, and to the commissioners and ask you, we are in your hands. You have the power to regulate Duke Energy. Is this a time that our state can rely on your courageous leadership? Please hold a hearing on the integrated resource plan, a hearing based on evidence and not on Duke's carefully concocted story. Ask hard questions about the secret assumptions and numbers that Duke presented in their secret model. We, the people of North Carolina, are counting on you to regulate Duke more closely and carefully than ever. You have the power. You make the decisions. We're relying on you. Literally, our lives are in your hands. Thank you, Ms. Moore. Good to see you again. Thank you. Michael Matthews. I do. You can you please state your name, address, and your electric provider? My name is Michael Matthews. My address is 32 Mills Place, Asheville, North Carolina, 28804. I am the owner of the Ivy River Hydroelectric Plant in Madison County. I will be truncating my remarks, but we'll submit them in full. Can I ask you for the microphone? How about? The chair don't move. You have to move the microphone. Thank you. The Ivy River plant's construction was completed at an existing dam in 1987, and under standard contracts it has provided capacity and energy at 3 gigawatt hours per year for three and a half decades since. At higher capacities in the winter and spring months when capacity is now identified as being needed most. At 1.2 megawatts on the nameplate, my plant falls into a new category that is ineligible for standard contracts and must now negotiate contracts instead. I would like someone to explain how you negotiate with an entity that claims they do not need your product and openly projects in this IRP that there will be zero products like your projects like yours in 13 years. I would like this to sink in for a moment. DEP projects that 266 megawatts of current hydro and biomass will be reduced to zero in 13 years. Zero megawatts of installed capacity, ladies and gentlemen. They are telling us that we will be out of business. How can they make such an assumption? All the while, they have plans to replace these plants with company-owned generation upon their assumption that independent power producers that have generated for decades will suddenly retire their operations. This is a most unreasonable expectation. 
Are the power companies planning on shuttering all of their hydroelectric facilities? Hydropower has been the predominant renewable energy source for the past century. It is generated 24-7, distributed, baseload, consistent power. There is no reason to expect this should change. That being said, the industry has operated under consistent rules that have been in place and worked well since Purple was enacted. A massive disruption like we are seeing in this IRP, the current rate case, and the recently passed legislation causes great uncertainty and reduces the likelihood of anyone investing further in our industry, myself included. Furthermore, it endangers those of us whose standard contracts expire soon of being bankrupted by these unrealistic projections and subsequent policies made from them. Hydroelectric power plants attract a certain type of individual. We are all entrepreneurs, we are risk takers, we are skilled, we have multiple businesses with wide-ranging impacts on our community. I moved from Georgia, brought two other small businesses with me, and have started another business locally. Regulation should not impede investment in sensible ventures. To conclude, I still think it odd that the only entity legally able to purchase my energy is currently predicting that I will be out of business in the near future while they are busy preparing to build facilities to replace me. I look forward to many more years producing clean, renewable power here in North Carolina under hopefully realistic, fair, and sensible regulations. Thank you for your time. Wagner. I prefer to affirm, please. I do. Please state your name, address, and your electric provider, please. Jerome, Jerome Wagner of 110 Summer Lake Drive Southwest, Concord, North Carolina. Uh, we have a municipally supplied system in Concord which is fed from NTE Energy. Good evening and thank you for this opportunity to speak to you. I currently represent and am speaking on behalf of 350 Charlotte. We strongly advise that the Commission reject the integrated resource plan submitted to it by Duke Energy. The actions proposed by Duke not only don't remedy the climate crisis, rather they feed the fire of climate change. I echo many of the concerns that have been spoken here already. The term clean energy has snuck its way into the formal planning and vision setting, far short of forcing us to develop true renewable resources, solar, wind, tidal, hydro, which is the aim of the state's REPS program, we seem satisfied to designate natural gas as clean and nuclear as clean. The prospects of additional natural gas fired power plants and of continued large scale coal use through the plant horizon of 2033 are just plain wrong. Both must be eliminated. The continued long-term reliance on, existing, on the existing nuclear fleet proposed in the plans is effectively a Trojan horse. Subsequent license renewal for the nuclear plants slows our deployment of true renewable energy sources while running increasing risks of both catastrophic incidents and other factors suspending their operations. According to a report issued in November 2018, North Carolina, with its maximum reps rate of 12.5%, is within one slot of being the lowest requirement in the nation. I'll submit some evidence of that report. In 2030, uh, around the state, towns and cities, including Charlotte, are striving to become low-carbon entities. Their vision and intention are entirely dependent on Duke and their plans for the future. In 2033, my grandsons will be working their ways through college. Under the proposed plan, Duke will still be burning coal and natural gas. The current IRPs will simply translate into IRI, translate into RIP, rest in peace. Rest in peace for the prospects that we ought to bless them with now. Task Duke. I ask that ta you task Duke with a dramatically larger goal for reduction in fossil fuel use and for increased integration of renewable energy. Thank you. Beth Henry.
In this case, will be the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth, Dr. Carter. I do. Please state your name, address, and your letter, please. Beth Henry, 3066 Stony Brook Road, Charlotte, 28205, Duke Energy, Carolinas. Um, I'm here because I'm concerned, like everybody else, about the worsening climate crisis, but I want to talk about the storage study. I actually read not only the IRP but the 300 page storage study which said that there's huge potential for adding substantial amounts of cost effective storage during the 15 year period covered by the IRP. The researchers from State, NC Central, the Technology Center found that large-scale batteries could provide more benefits than costs even at 2019 prices and they're expecting those prices to go way down by 2033. So why is Duke proposing really just a trivial amount of storage in this IRP? The experts who wrote that storage study seem perplexed that Duke is calling for so little storage and their explanation was and I quote analysis can be sensitive to the assumptions employed in other words bull crap in bull crap out is what they seem to be suggesting um, Unfortunately, we don't know what the assumptions were, and even those experts commissioned by the legislature don't know because it's all proprietary and confidential. So our monopoly utility is telling us we have to go with natural gas because it's cheaper, but we don't know what assumptions, like what discount rates they're putting in that can hugely affect what future natural gas you know they're saying it costs we don't even know what the assumptions are so the combination of what the study concluded what's happening in other places where really cheap bids are coming in for solar plus storage just really makes me question what the assumptions are in Duke's secret confidential proprietary IRP formula. So what I want to ask the Commission to do is hold Duke's feet to the fire. Please, with so much at stake with the future of all of our children and grandchildren, don't just let them pick their, their assumptions and say, oh sorry, based on our secret formula and our secret assumptions, we're not going to do solar plus storage. Please have a hearing let their experts be subject to cross-examination and hear other experts bring evidence about how it is possible to move more rapidly to energy that will protect us and the future rather than destroy it. The next four are Joshua Levinson, John Wagner, Liv Hutchby, and John Merrill. We can start with Joshua Levinson. Would you like to come to the microphone and raise your hand, please? Silence, let the testimony about to get this case make the truth. The whole truth is nothing but the truth, Jeffrey Garner. Yes, sir. Can you please state your name, address, and your provider, please? Joshua James Levinson, 142 Lincoln Lane, 27516. Chapel Hill, um, I believe Duke Energy. Yep. Okay. So there's been a lot of knowledge and wisdom shared by these people who know, I think, far more about all these issues. And I think one person who mentioned that I wish there was that extra opportunity to have a civil conversation where this could be a dialogue and these ideas could be elaborated in the most important and valuable ways and we could collaborate in creating something that would like lead to a sustainable future 
um, which I do strongly um, believe involves significantly more renewable energy and involves, yeah, not a huge investment in these power plants. One story I want to bring up from my childhood when I was graduating from middle school or, and about to start high school, that summer was kind of marred by um, a huge burst of the Olympic pipeline, which killed three children, like one kid who was graduating from high school and two children graduating from middle school, and blew up the huge park in the center of our town. And there are just unbelievable costs that can be associated with these things. Uh, I think it was $112 million that was set for the, that company to put back towards reparations, which yeah, we don't see in a lot of settings. Um, in addition to all the climate change issues that a lot of other people brought up here, I think one thing that's really important is what's happening to our groundwater, which goes unseen, and the fact that we're not seeing like the regular rain that we used to see for many decades comes from the fact that there's five times more particulate matter in the air, which leads to these rain bursts and is just drowning out our aquifers from California to the East Coast. And that is something that will take hundreds of years to restore because bringing back the water aquifers is really critical. So thank you very much. I wish you guys well. Take care. John Wagner. That's one you're about to give. This case will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth shall be God. I do. Can you please state your name, address, and your provider, please? Yes. My name is John Wagner. My address is 210 Jessamine Lane, Pittsburgh, North Carolina, 27312. And my provider is Duke Energy. Although, since I'm under oath, I can't honestly call it progress. <laughs> um, Please reject Duke's IRP in its entirety. Duke's IRP and its renewable energy plan is a joke. 8% is unreal. But there isn't anything funny about locking North Carolina into frack gas pipelines, dozens of frack gas power plants, and committing the state to decades of burning more fossil fuels. And in addition to the climate, Duke's ACP in the IRP is a disaster for our state's rivers, for our streams, for our wetlands, and it's creating an environmental justice crisis for our low-income communities, our indigenous communities, and communities of color across eastern North Carolina. Duke has the finances and the vast resources, and they could not only become a model of distributed renewable solar energy for the entire country, but they could save the taxpayers and the ratepayers money. You, the members of the Utilities Commission, have the power and the responsibility to make this happen. If Duke can't protect the clim climate and the planet, then reject the IRP in its entirety and end Duke's monopoly. Our planet is in a crisis and we cannot afford 15 more years of Duke's madness. Thank you. Liv Hutchby. Right it's on this web. The testimony you're about to give in this case will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Can you please state your name, address, and your electric provider, please? My name is Lib Hutchby. I'm at 108 Standish Drive, Chapel Hill, North Carolina. And I like to say that 
we have, um, when our electricity goes off, we don't lose power, we just lose electricity. Um, but uh, I am happy to say that what you have in front of you, as you noticed, I just noticed this, there's water here, right? You have water. Do you have it in a plastic bottle? How many of you brought your own mug? You brought your own water. So where is this coming from? You say, well, my goodness, it's late at night. Why is this woman talking about water again? I've been here so many times that I recognize your face. We've talked many times about water, about how to protect our grandchildren, how to protect the whole earth, how to protect the species that are being killed by the Atlantic Coast Pipeline when they try to go under. Did you know that the Tar River has already been attempted to be drilled? I mean, it's like, what if you live near the drilling rig and had to listen to the damn thing all night long for a week? And then know that in your heart, there is absolutely no need for an Atlantic Coast Pipeline. No need at all. Nor is there need for a Mountain Valley Pipeline. Nor is there need for more methane and natural gas that's coming through those frack pipelines. Okay, so, yes, I too oppose Duke Energy and Dominion Resources IRPs and call on you to reject their IRPs as proposed. With political will, you can demand revisions in their plans that reflect reality for at least two at least two years. I mean, it goes really way back farther than that, I'm sure. Clean, cheap, renewable, and storage have been available, and yet Duke's business model continues to be archaic and disastrous for the future. For all species, it is disastrous. And I know you can do better. And I know the Utilities Commission can do better. I expect you to reject Duke Energy and Dominion's archaic energy generation plans. And I also recommend to you a book entitled Water, the Epic Struggle for Wealth, Power, and Civilization. And believe it or not, it came out in 2010. And here's what, just a few, few sentences. Water is overtaking oil as the world's scarcest critical natural resource. But water is more than the new oil. Oil, in the end, is unsubstitutable. Oh no, oil is, in the end, substitutable, albeit painfully by other fuel sources or energy sources or in extremes can be done without. But water's uses are pervasive, irreplaceable by any other substance, and utterly indispensable. So I recommend this. This is by Stephen Solomon. And thank you again. And understand, this book was written in 2010, and it is now 2019. What will you decide? Please. <coughs> John Merrill. It's also in the test one about to give this case, but the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth shall be lied. That'll do. Please state your name, address, and your provider. Uh, John Merrill, 4508 Star Mount Drive, Greensboro, North Carolina, 27410, and uh, Duke Power, Duke Energy is my provider. Uh, good evening, members of the commission. My name is John Merrill. Uh, I'm the advocacy coordinator for Triad, North Carolina, AARP, which represents 16 counties in the north central and northwestern part of the state. We are a national advocacy organization that advocates for the well-being and rights of American citizens 
age 50 and older. We stand in opposition to the rate increase that's being requested by Duke Energy, just like we did last year. I'd like to give you some numbers. Our organization now has over 38 million members. We have over 1.1 million members here in North Carolina. According to the Census Bureau, 10,000 people a day in this country are turning 65. 10,000 a day. And that, that trend is supposed to continue nonstop, straight through, all the way into the mid to late 2030s. With that aging population, it's going to represent numerous challenges to North Carolinians and really people all across the country. An organization with that many members, naturally, some of our members are affluent, some of them are middle class, and some are low to moderate income. This rate uh, increase that's being projected by Duke, requested by Duke, is going to severely hurt the low to moderate income members of our organization. And they represent quite a few people. So we ask you in your deliberations to please keep in mind older North Carolinians who simply cannot afford this large rate increase. Thank you for your service on the commission. Thank you for your time. The next four are Marvin Winstead, Barbara Smiley McMahon, Wayne Turner, and Kirk Port. And we'll start with Marvin Winstead. The testimony about the this case will be the truth. The whole truth and nothing but the truth shall be done. I do. Can you please state your name, address, and your provider, please? Marvin Winstead, Jr., 540 Sandy Cross Road, Nashville, NC, 27856. Duke Energy Progress is my provider. Thank you. I, in the interest of brevity, I will refer to the five previous speakers who have covered points that I would have made to you. Kay Rebold, Martha Girolami, Amanda Robertson, Avon Friedman, Mark Coppolis and John Wagner have already covered the points I was made. I will close in the same. IRP is supposed to be an acronym for Integrated Resource Plan. What the companies have submitted to you is a dismal failure. What has been submitted is an irresponsible resource plan. Please reject the company's submission and insist on a plan that serves the public well and not fatten the pockets of the shareholders. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Winston. Barbara Smalley McMahon, 602 North Bloodworth Street, Raleigh, and my provider is Duke Energy. Um, I'm a fish out of water, so to speak, in this room. I'm not a scientist, and I won't even tell you the grades I made in science. Um, I am a minister. I had a career as a pastoral counselor for 30 years. Before that, I was a chaplain at Duke Hospital. And I was with children who were dying. I have seen and been with children and parents who were losing children because of cancers of all kinds. We're, we're facing a crisis coming up. I find it so strange that Duke Energy has asked for 15 years of, high, of high, heightening their rates when in 11 years we are going to all be much more conscious than many people want to be today about the costs we are facing because of the climate change that is going on for all of the scientific reasons that many, many bright people in this room have shared. 
as a chaplain, my job was not to hide my head in the sand and participate in denial. I could not have helped anybody who was losing their child if I couldn't help them dig deep inside themselves to be able to face the truth so that when their child was dying, their child would wait for them to be there. Children whose parents couldn't face the reality, they waited for me to be there. We're asking for you to be there. Duke Energy is in denial. Actually, they're in greed, serious greed. You all, we need you not to be in denial. We need you to face their greed that motivates them, and we need to face you to face the climate change that is upon us. Linda Rodriguez, Bob Rodriguez's wife, told me yesterday at our Care of Creation class at Poland Memorial Baptist Church that people in Australia are already leaving. It's going to become uninhabitable. And I read last night a story about the alligators and the snakes that are washing up on land because of the extreme flooding going on in Australia right now. We are facing a crisis. And some people have applauded you for the power that you have. And we pray for the wisdom to use it. Thank you. Wayne Turner. Thank you, firm, please. I do. Thank you. Please state your name, address, and your provider. Wayne Turn. My address is 244A Cedar Lake Road, Chapel Hill, North Carolina, 27516. My provider is Duke Energy Progress. Many thanks to the Commission for allowing me to speak. I speak here today in two capacities, both as a private rate payer for Duke, but also as a member and an officer of the North Carolina Green Party. Duke Energy and its various incarnations and partnerships have enjoyed for decades a legal and regulatory framework granting them virtual monopoly status and endowing them with the rights, e.g. the right of exercise of eminent domain, normally reserved for governments. In exchange for this, it is assumed that Duke Energy provides a public good, namely the production of affordable energy for the citizens in its service areas. However, a public good that has built into it caveats, such as the acceptance of environmental degradation and the emission of greenhouse gases, is a questionable value. In this day and time, we ignore or minimize these exceptions at our peril. Successive IPCC reports filed over the years have made clear mankind faces stark choices. We keep fossil fuels in the ground, or we burn our biosphere beyond reclamation. Duke Energy's IRP does not acknowledge this reality beyond noting that possible legislation affecting greenhouse emissions may change its future energy costs and energy production. This is because Duke Energy seeks a private profit for shareholders and socialization of the impact of its activities on the environment in which we must all live. The North Carolina Green Party contends that this position is in conflict with the production of a public good. It is time to stop the endless round of proposals, negotiations, argument, and politicking that delay our transition to clean energy sources. Duke cannot or will not make this transition. The North Carolina Green Party calls upon the Utility Commission not only to reject the IRP, but to go further to recommend to the state of North Carolina that the state of North Carolina remove control of Duke Energy from its shareholders and administer it upon behalf of the citizens of North Carolina with a whole view of the impact of energy production on the region and the planet and eschewing a narrow focus on the value of Duke Energy shares on the stock market, 
profits avail a few, environmental destruction affects many. Thank you. I do. Could you please state your name, address, and provider? Kirkport, 5015 Simmons Ranch Trail, Raleigh, 27606. Could you use the microphone? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, Kirkport, 5015 Simmons Ranch Trail, Raleigh, North Carolina, 27606. I am a customer and an investor in Duke Energy. Um, I want to thank all the previous uh, speakers who so eloquently articulated the dire consequences that we are facing with climate change. Uh, Duke's IRP is catastrophic for the, the environment and for the citizens uh, of the state. Um, one thing I do want to point out, um, Duke's IRP is also uh, a failure for, for investors. Um, if you look at Duke's current REP, it's pretty low compared to um, some of um, its other competitors. And take, for example, if you had invested $1,000 in Duke Energy 10 years ago, it'd be worth $1,927. If you look at their competitor, Next Era Energy, who has a really large REP, that $1,000 would be $3,413. So um, Duke's recalcitrance in, in expanding their, their REP is actually failing their investors, and that's something to take in mind. Thank you. The next four, Emily Wilkins, Andrea Stewart Parnell, um, Maureen Hayes, and Angie Shatas. We'll start with Emily Wilkins. Permission to stand? You're going to have to, you can stand, but you need to pull that microphone around so you can talk into the I've just seen people struggle getting in and out of the chair. I don't want to fall. Pull that Bible over there, too, please, man. Pull the Bible over there so you can swear yourself in. The Bible. See the Bible in? The Bible. Oh, I'm not going to put my hand on the Bible. Can I affirm? Yes, you may. You saw me in front of the testimony about the this case with the truth. The whole truth is about the truth. I do. I'm Emily Wilkins. I live at 611 Ruby Street in Durham, North Carolina. And Duke Energy, and I agree with the previous commenter, I can't honestly say it's progress. Um, I also am not a scientist and um, also won't go into my grades in science. <clears throat> but I'd like to reference Mac Ledgerton, who spoke on the impact on native communities in Pembroke regarding the ACP. And I want to share, as a resident of Durham, that I am concerned as um, what we're doing to our environment. And I think Native American people feel especially connected to the land. And any degradation of the land is a degradation to their life. I speak on behalf of renters and owners in urban tree filled spaces for whom rooftop solar is not feasible and retrofitting is not economically viable. Our fate is inextricably linked to yours. We will bear the added cost of the exodus of those who can afford to opt out of Duke Energy, who can build their own solar. Um, on my street, on Ruby Street, I smell gas. Not always, but a whiff here and there, regularly, routinely. And every time I've called Duke Energy, they've sent somebody out. Uh, sorry, um, it's not Duke Energy that does the gas. Uh, now Dominion, Progress. Um, and so I know what gas smells like, the, the substance that they put in gas so that it's detectable. And it's an awful smell, and it gives headaches. Um, I can only imagine what it's like for Pembroke to have all of those coalescing um, pieces of a network of gas impacting their communities. It sinks to the low ground, and we know from the recent flood that Lumberton was especially hard hit because it's a low-lying area. Um, Duke is scared. I'm sorry that you're scared. We need to talk about your fear. You've heard that you're... Dr. Commissioner Wilkins, Dr. Commissioner, please. So, sorry. 
Um, Duke is scared because private people are installing private solar and they're benefiting from it. Um, the municipal changes that are happening, like Orange High School, which is installing uh, geothermal throughout its its school so that it can dissociate from the need to purchase power. Um, the loss of revenue is going to be acute for Duke, and we hate it for you, but get over it. Um, we speak, I spoke at, uh, against gas plants that Duke was trying to negotiate with Duke University, telling them that it would be oh so great if they would build a, a gas plant on their property and benefit from that. I'm sorry, I'm low lying down from Duke University, and I don't want the gas leaks to come into my neighborhood and make it hard for me to breathe. Um, please work with us. People like me don't have choices. I ask you to reject the integrated resource plan and hold evidentiary hearings live around the state. Plan your hearings to visit distant North Carolina locations so that they can get a flavor for what it's like to be in Raleigh where all the decisions get made. Plan your vacation around it. Hear from the people around the state so that they, those who can't travel can come and participate in this democracy. Thank you. Right, Andrea Stewart Parnell. Sorry, my wife signed us both down. It's I'm Stuart Powell. Sorry. Thanks. Sorry about that. So I'm sorry, the testimony about the investigation was the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth shall be gone. I did. Could you please state your name, address, and your private? Stuart Powell, uh, 615 East Lenore Street, Raleigh, 27601, and Duke Energy. Uh, the last time I, I swore I'd do, I was getting married. Uh, so <laughs> it was about a uh, year and a half ago. Uh, at the same time, uh, that's when we had Hurricanes Harvey, Irma, and Maria. So we didn't know if, our, if, we didn't know if it was going to turn and our wedding get wrecked. But while I was on my honeymoon, I was reading about all the deaths and economic damage that came from those storms. Um, as Greta Thunberg, the 16-year-old climate activist that you've probably heard about, has expressed on the international stage, our house is on fire and we are 12 years away from not being able to undo our mistakes. The good news, however, is clean energy is advancing rapidly and becoming more affordable each, as each year passes. Similar to Moore's Law, with computers, solar, wind, and batteries are seeing drastic drops in costs. As I like to say, eco not only means environmentally friendly, but it's also eco economic sense. Yet Duke, Duke seems to ignore this cost curve and innovation curve. As someone mentioned earlier, we need to look into their assumptions to figure out what, where are they getting these numbers because these costs are coming down drastically. I applaud Duke for for having a 40% drop in greenhouse emissions by 2030, but if you look at Excel Energy, they have a plan that would drop it by 80% by 2030. So there's obviously a flaw in this plan. Furthermore, Duke, Duke's plan has 8% renewables by 2033, while Excel announced last month that they have aggressive plans for 100% clean electricity by 2050. So there's a huge disconnect in this plan. Excel CEO commented, we're accelerating our global re our carbon reduction goals because we're encouraged by advances in technology, motivated by customers who are asking for it, and committed to working with partners to make it happen. In this situation, you can hear everyone, Duke is not motivated by their customers. Um, it is evident that people want solar energy. The solar rebates went out in hours, not days, went out in hours this year. You can't get the rebate anymore until next year. Furthermore, everyone here has been asking for it. I haven't heard one person come and say, I want more coal. <laughs> Congress, and, and the other thing we need to look into the future, Congress has introduced bills in both the House and the Senate for the first time in a decade that would put a price on carbon. It's going to be inevitable, and what's going to happen is Duke's going to build all of these assets that are then going to be uneconomical in a decade. And then who's going to be stuck with it? It's going to be us, the ratepayers. And let's see, you saw what happened with the coal ash issue. We're now paying for their mistakes.
so don't let them continue to make mistakes. I'm demanding that you send Duke back to the drawing board and come back with a more aggressive 15-year plan. If plan A doesn't work, then we're going to have to go to plan B, which is to make a competitive market in North Carolina so that we can no longer have monopolies controlling the way that we do things here. I'm asking that the public utility re represent the public's interests and not Duke shareholders. I believe that you can and you will make the best decision that your grandchildren will thank you for. Thank you. Maureen Hayes. Maureen Hayes from Chapel Hill. Angie Chatas. Angie Shattis, two for. You're telling us what the testimony is about to give in this case will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Don't forget. I do. Angie Shattis, 2465 Wayfair Court, Chapel Hill, North Carolina, 27514, Duke Energy. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. Thank you for the opportunity to comment on Duke Energy's 2018 Integrated Resource Plan. I have many comments. I will confine them to three, and I will submit my full written testimony via email later. Number one, please accelerate the coal phase-out time frame. Duke's forward-looking plan adds solar resources, but overwhelmingly relies on natural gas-fired EGUs to replace the aging and economically unviable coal units. Duke indicates the coal would be phased out by 2050, which is a very long time horizon. That's another generation. While the coal phase out is welcomed, I urge a faster timeline. Number two, unfortunately, displace the coal, not with natural gas, but with solar and wind combined with storage, along with increased energy efficiency programs. Much of the natural gas, unfortunately, comes from hydraulic fracturing or fracking, which is transported from the Marcellus and Utica shale formations. This comes with serious environmental costs, including damage to drinking water, methane emissions, and the construction of pipelines. We've all heard that methane is a far more potent climate forcer than CO2, and it is not if, but when, pipelines leak. Between Duke Energy Progress and Duke Energy Consumers, natural gas capacity would add 9,534 megawatts by 2033. In the same time frame, Duke plans to add 3,671 megawatts of solar capacity. I challenge us to flip that. I urge the replacement again not to be natural gas, but instead to be solar and wind resources combined with a greater use of energy efficiency, which, as we all know, is the least cost resource. Number three, increase residential and commercial solar. According to the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, North Carolina has a solar potential of 4.2 to 4.9 kilowatts per hour per meter squared, and our state is ranked number two in the nation for installed solar. I urge an expansion of our solar adoption and I leave you with a quick story that just happened. The case in point is about the residential and commercial solar rebate program. In 2018, about 5,900 Duke Energy North Carolina customers owned private solar systems. In that year, Duke Energy began offering rebates. The 2018 money ran out in two weeks. In 2019, about 8,700 Duke Energy North Carolina customers owned private solar systems. That is an increase of 2,800 over the year before, but still only a very small fraction. By my envelope, back of the envelope calculations, that's 0.3% of Duke's 3.4 million customers in North Carolina. Duke opened the solar rebate program on January 2nd and in two days, it was completely subscribed and there is a waiting list for 2019. I urge an expansion of programs like this. Overall, I urge you
to ask Duke to reconsider this IRP and give us a bold plan that is worthy of the 21st century. Thank you. Next four are Sandy Smith Naoni, Colleen McNamara, Mara Frank, and Mimi Boyette. Start with Sandy Smith. No, Mimi. Thank you. I know it's hard. Solomon's one of the testimony about in this case will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, John I do. My name, I'm sorry. Your name, address, and your provider, please. My name is Sandy Smith Nonini. I'm uh, at 2030 Inglewood Avenue in Durham, North Carolina, and my uh, provider is Duke Energy and also the, the four kilowatt solar panels on our roof. Um, I'm an anthropologist at UNC Chapel Hill and I do research on energy and debt uh, and uh, climate change with specializing in troubled utilities in this past year I've done field work in two different places with chronic debt and, uh, and utilities that are deeply in debt and places where there is energy poverty. Um, you've heard from others about the evidence that methane emissions from fracking and gas pipelines accelerate climate change. What I'd like to speak to specifically is the problematic future of fracked gas. I encourage you to review Canadian geological scientist David Hughes' work. Uh, he has many reports out and the most recent one I believe is called the Shale Reality Check, which you can find by googling pretty easily. Uh, but he has quite a few reports. And he shows basically that the US Energy Information Agency, or EIA, has grossly overestimated future production of fracked gas, uh, uh, most likely because they rely so heavily on industry estimates. And also, the industry is very interested in maintaining the hype uh, because they rely very heavily on bank loans to keep the fracking going. Um, the data suggests that the gas fields will peak in the 2020s, not in the 2030s, as the EIA predicts. And there's a fair amount of evidence that the peaking may happen in the early 2020s. In addition, about 90% of the companies drilling for shale and shale basins are not making profits. They continue to pay to, to, to pump in order to pay their bank loans. But the ongoing situations with low gas prices and with low demand globally suggest that the fracked gas boom will end abruptly as the economy supporting this extremely expensive technology is fragile. And in addition, if we are to, in the future, the likelihood that we'll get a price on carbon will make the economics even more fraught. This means that the pipeline infrastructure in the 24 gas plants that Duke plans to build will be running far below capacity long before their lifetime is up, and that will leave taxpayers on the hook for their capital costs and financing, while diverting funds that would be better directed to building renewable infrastructure for a future that our children can live with. It's your job to investigate these issues and to do the right thing on behalf of this future this generation and the future generation of ratepayers. Please investigate the utility reform guidelines from the Rocky Mountain Institute. And I encourage you to hold hearings, uh, evidentiary hearings, to include more testimony by experts with knowledge on both fossil fuels as well as renewable sources, and to reject this IRP. Thank you. Colleen McNamara. I do. If you can say your name, address, and your provider, please. Uh, it's the 30, 3116 Hillsborough Street in Raleigh, and Duke Energy is my provider. Um, What's your name? What's your name? Oh, my name is Colleen McNamara. Sorry, I uh, guess I did that in the wrong order. 
Um, so I'm just kind of here as a human being and pleading to you as human beings to do the right thing. Uh, I think the truth kind of has a way of resonating here. You're listening to a lot of people that are talking about, you know, people dying, rates that are too high, businesses that are being lost, um, regulations. Where are the regulations here? Um, public utilities that are not being regulated, and you people can make a change. You are the people who is representing me? Who in my generation had a choice when we saw what I believe is now the largest conglomerate in American history? So another thing that's resonating is definitely greed. Um, who do you want to be here? Do you want to be the JP Morgan? We're talking about clean energy, but let's look at history. Nikola Tesla figured that out way back in the day. And uh, it didn't cost anything, so JP Morgan said, get out of my office. So we know what we're dealing with here. And I ask you to be a human being, to see that I'm a person here that struggles to pay the bills. What can I do? Go to the other energy company? Mm, I don't think there is one. So there are small changes that you can make. You don't have to gouge the American people. You can make rate decreases for once. You can either go down in history as freedom fighters people that brought back the true America, like this guy said, Thomas Jefferson, FDR. Or you can go down in history as the people like Rockefeller, the people like J.P. Morgan that said, hey, get out of my office. That's all I really have to say. Mara Frank. Mara Frank of Raleigh. Mimi Boyette. So I'm just wondering the testimony you're about to give this case away the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth that we got. I do. Can you please state your name, address, and your provider, please? My name is Melissa Boyette High, and I live at 717 Gray Rock Road in Whitsitt, North Carolina, 27377. I'm sorry, and could you move the microphone in front of your mouth, please? My name is Melissa Boyette. Um, I live at 717 Gray Rock Road in Whitsitt, North Carolina, 27377, and Duke Power is my provider. Um, my name is Melissa Boyette, and I will be replacing Donald Trump in 2020, if not sooner, with a joint resolution and the help of support from Hollywood and Nashville for God's plan of jubilee and revolution. I am hugely discouraged by the repeat activist you have said good to see you again to. Why are we still fighting and refighting for, the, for environmental change? They work for us. I would like to suggest that Duke Energy's interest in short-term economic increase with 8% proposal is about our almighty do dollar. They know it is going down, and they are trying to grab as much of it for themselves as they can before they are held accountable. You members of the Utility Commission will go back and negotiate for 16 or maybe 24 percent and convince the voters that you've accomplished something. Please open your minds for a real solution for all. I was flipping a home at the coast when I personally experienced a methanol gas pocket. I was poisoned by the simple removal of an old toilet. I was also a provider to the builder of Greensboro when their fracking caused the water to catch on fire. Please consider Jubilee. There is a way for Duke Energy to reach their financial goals by creating market share within the 300 third world countries instead of stealing it here in the USA. There is a way for America to reach its 100% renewable energy much sooner than predicted. With Jubilee, green power providers would have all they need for growth opportunities. God's economic plan is 3,500 years old, and it's their call to come back to God. With this vision, it was started by Isaiah, and it will be implemented this year. Isaiah 59 says, So shall they fear the name of the Lord from the west, and his glory from the rising sun, when the enemy shall come in like a flood. The Spirit of the Lord shall lift a standard against him. The standards are the recent floods and hurricanes. 
you cannot deplete Mother Earth of her natural gas and breath without severe consequences. The rising oceans can be capitalized on with the desalinization. We must recognize that almost one third of the world needs clean drinking water. Together, there is a solution for all. Instead of all of this all or nothing, fascist establishment, I'm gonna get mine now attitude. The him Isaiah spoke of is the fake president that resides in the White House. Duke Power and my fellow tree huggers, please join me in celebrating our rights for, to religious freedom. There is a way for all of us to get and have what we need. Please join me at beincorruptible.net for solutions. We must take control of our dollar and take control of our corrupt government. All of you will be held accountable for the decisions you make here with regard to Duke Power. We want solutions instead of sides. As one of my favorite bands, 30 Minutes to Mars, says, now do you believe you can walk on water? Thank you. Um, I have three names remaining that have signed to speak. Um, to speak. I'm going to list those names. If you are here and you want to speak and you aren't called with these three, if you can come see me while well, someone else is speaking. Um, the names I have are Keith Almeida, Julie Brown and Jalen Almeida. So we'll start with Keith Almeida. Please, 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 uh, your name, address, and your provider, please. Keith Almeida. My address is 634 Jubilee Court in Wake Forest, North Carolina, 27587. Uh, my provider is actually Wake Forest Power, but I believe in 2015 that was actually sold to Duke um, so that the liability for the municipality was no longer in the hands of the taxpayers of Wake Forest. Um, first off, I just want to say thank you all for being here. Um, this has got to be a rough practice in patience and listening skills. Um, I myself, a graduate of North Carolina Central University, um, have a bachelor's degree. Uh, I'm sure all of you guys are very intelligent people. Um, I worked for a um, Fortune 50 electronics retailer for 14 years here in North Carolina and I did business plans for a very long time. Um, realistically, this is a bad business plan. It's not sustainable for the future. I think the people that were involved in writing this business plan, um, the business should take a look at those individuals and question whether they should be gainfully employed further. <laughs> realistically, as a stockholder, if you make a business plan that does not sustain the business and costs me money, I do not want to continue to invest in that business. Come up with a better plan. The transparency was not there. It's very hard to find the information regarding this particular plan. And I think that as representatives for us, for the General Assembly, you guys have the opportunity to take a look at it and go, is this a good plan? And then do something about it. I like power. I spend a lot of my time on my computers, on my HVAC system, on my phone. We all use it. We all have the opportunity to be here today because of the light and the time clock here, because of the power that's generated and sold to us. My electric bill is less than $100 a month. It's because I have a passive solar house. We have options, we have choices. I'm hoping that you guys take a look at this plan and recognize that it's a, not a good plan. And that's it. Thank you. Sarah Tabor. I do. Can you please state your name, address, and your provider, please? Sarah Tabor, uh, 100 Hay Street, Fayetteville, North Carolina. Yeah, my provider is PWC, but they get their power from Duke, so. 
All right, I am Dr. Sarah Tabor. I'm a business owner with multiple businesses in agricultural manufacturing technology in Fayetteville, North Carolina. The previous speakers have focused a lot on climate and environmental effects of this IRP, as well they should. I know that the commission, however, is obligated to consider economics of the IRP as well. As a business owner, this is what I'd like to address. Duke's IRP is an economic mess. It rides on frat gas, which they're touting as a jobs program. That's not the case. Gas is the single worst job creator in the utilities sector. Conservative estimates put solar at twice the permanent full-time jobs potential. Duke rides hard on the image of poor, benighted Eastern North Carolina to sell its projects uh, to well-heeled stakeholders in Charlotte and the Triangle. I'm from those poor areas they're talking about. I do business there. And as a tech business owner, I can tell you two things. Solar without subsidies has been cheaper in North Carolina than gas since at least 2015. So all this marketing about how it's going to be cheap, affordable power is not evidence-based, it is spin. And second, we don't just need affordable energy in eastern North Carolina, we need jobs. And again, Duke's plan is the worst possible plan for economic growth in eastern North Carolina. This plan, this IRP, puts us, it locks us into shipping money out of state every single day just to keep the lights on. In Cumberland County alone, if we made our own energy with wind and solar and biomass, we're looking at an extra $180 million in our county economy every year. For the whole state of North Carolina, <coughs> excuse me, that's $3 billion per year. And Duke's IRP is the main thing standing in our way. <coughs> excuse me. In states with power companies that have to compete for a living, <coughs> excuse me, uh, are installing solar and wind and batteries because it's cheap and because that's the best plan for economic growth. So, Commission, I would urge you to have hearings on this in the communities that are affected by the pipeline plans and in communities that are actually experiencing this poverty that Duke is telling you they're going to fix. And I urge you to reject this IRP. Thank you. Julia Brown. Yes. You can state your name, address, and your provider, please. My name is Julia Brown. My address is 1203 Watt Street, and my provider is Duke Energy. Is that oh, yes, that's in there. Thanks. <laughs> um, okay. I'm 23 years old. Um, barring any unforeseen circumstances, I'll be alive when we hit the one and a half degrees Celsius of warming. And I just wanted to say, uh, you have a lot of influence, and you have a lot more influence than I do, over how many more degrees of warming I'll be alive to see, and how many more degrees of warming people who are younger than me, who aren't even born yet, will be alive to see. And there are times when I'm really terrified to exist in the really strange new world that we're rapidly entering. I have a hard time dreaming about the future because it's hard to imagine what kind of ambitions I can have in a world that could be reduced to just a miserable struggle for resources um, by the decisions made today by people in power. I think that what we need right now is nothing short of an immediate phase out of all existing fossil fuel infrastructure and I urge you to do everything in your power to make this happen. Thank you. Last thing. Um, Jalen Almeida. No? Um, Jalen Almeida from Raleigh. No? That's the last name I had that's asked to speak. All right. Thank you all for coming out. For, us, for those of you who stayed to the end, we appreciate that. Uh, we've been here for a long time, and uh, we've listened carefully to all that you've said. And so this hearing is closed. Thank you very much.